GeekNet every fourth Monday at 7 p.m. W5FC. W5FC.
Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. When it is 9 o'clock, does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin tonight? Skynet! I'll take that as a no. This is Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie, X-Ray, KE5, ICX. My name's Tom. I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning subjects of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic. We encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using pro sign brake brake very enthusiastically in your call sign. Is there any, emer any emergency or priority traffic at this time? This is a direct net, so please do not transmit without direction from that control. That would be me this evening, and stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmission. This weekly net operates on this frequency with a field tone of 110.9. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using the name W5FC-R support station ID or Echolink node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio links are available online. Just go to the club website, which is W5FC.org. That's whiskey 5 chickenorg right now for the complete list. Remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. You need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is about 90 minutes long, give or take, and structured in several parts. We have general announcements. Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas, where and when you can look through a telescope. National Space Society. Uh, discussion topic of the evening was uh, space exploration, space history, constellation of the week, space launches, of the week, recent astronomical discoveries, physical satellite actions over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A in the 73 round. Depending on how far we get this evening, we may not get to all topics, but we'll get to the most important ones first. I'll now take check-ins. I'm going to take low power short time. If you are one of those, please come now with your call sign, phonetically your name. Uh, give me your location and let me know if you're low power short time. Uniform, Foxtrot, Romeo, Jacob, Low Power, Dallas. Kilo 5, Mike, Charlie, Delta, Cody and Dallas, Low Power. Okay, we've got KG5 UFR, Jacob, uh, Dallas, low power. I got K5MCD, Cody in Dallas, also low power. Anyone else? All right, we'll go ahead and move on to regular check-ins. If you are one of those, uh, please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, and where you're transmitting from. Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brenda and Dallas. Okay, I got WB50ZL, Brenda in Dallas. Your signal's good, by the way. Additional check-ins, let's go. This is Kilo India 5, Zulu Oscar Echo. 
Tommy from Balt Springs. Kilo Fox Shot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Kilo India 5, Uniform, Alpha, Uniform, David and Mesquite. This is Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel, Robert and Richardson. This is Kilo Golf 5, Whiskey, Victor Lima, James and Carrollton. Okay, let me go ahead and get those checked in. I got KI5ZOE, that's Tommy over in Bald Springs. Welcome, KI5ZBL, Mr. Bill, Farmer's Branch. KI5UAU, David in Mesquite. AA5AH, Robert Richardson. KG5 Whiskey, Victor Lima, that's James and Carrollton. Any additional? Golf Cruise in Arlington. November 5, Bravo, Bravo, Bill and Irving. Okay, I teased out two more. I got KI5KWG, Cruz in Arlington, and N5BB, Miss. Mr. Bill over in Irving. Anyone else before I move over to Echo Link? Okay, let's uh, go ahead and move over to Echo Link. I will take check-ins over there. I think we got all but one still to check in, so I will wait. If you're on Echo Link and like to join us, please come with your call sign, your name, where you were transmitting from. This is Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X-Ray, Kelly in point. All right, we pick up K5 KTX, Miss Kelly in point, and yes, I know that she is the only one who has not checked in, so why waste all that extra time? We got her in. I'll now open it up to anybody, anywhere, who would like to join us. Please come with your call sign phonetically. Kilo Juliet 5, Bravo India Sierra, Mark in Dallas. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put in uh, KJ5BIS. That's Mark over in Dallas. And uh, Chaz, did I not call on you? I'm going to put you in. KF5JHA. I did not hear you. You must have been uh, covered over. Chaz and Mesquite. I'll call on you in a little bit, though, because you're a major feature in our, our net. So... Uh, I've got you uh, checked in. Anyone else? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? These can be of ham, astronomical space, or of general interest to license ham.
Five KTX. K5KTX, Kelly, go ahead. Thank you, Tom. This is just a friendly reminder that we do have two solar eclipses coming up, and if you do not have your reservations yet, uh, you probably want to start thinking about that. From what I'm hearing, um, lots of places are selling out. And what is available is very, very expensive. So I do know that for the, um, the upcoming uh, annular eclipse on October the 14th, previously I had mentioned about the El Dorado Star Party. The Star Party itself has now stopped accepting reservations. However, I do believe they still have spots for just the Saturday of the eclipse. And they are very close to the center line um, for the annular eclipse on October 14th. So if you want to try to have a place to go. Um, it's at the X Bar Ranch. So you can go to ElBaredoStarParty.org and uh, sign up there if you want to have a secured spot for that eclipse. And then April the 8th, uh, 2024, the Texas Star Party is having a four night event uh, near just west of West. So southwest of Hillsboro and northwest of Waco. It's going to be a prime location. Um, the event begins on April the 5th and April the 9th. Um, they do have accommodations there if you want to stay. Um, and um, it's going to be at the Latham Springs um, Retreat. And um, they are at that location. They're going to have 4 minutes and 23.3 seconds of totality. Uh, so it should be an excellent location. And they have open reservations at this point. Um, they do have meals that will be available, and so it will be very similar to the regular Texas Star Party. Um, so you can go to texasstarparty.org and um, check that out so that you can get a spot for the April uh, total solar eclipse. And that's all I've got. This is K5KTX. Back to you, Tom. Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Does anyone need any fills? Please come with your call. Okay, hearing none, I'll uh, go through some of these fairly quickly because uh, just about everybody here is aware of them. There's the AMSAT Amateur Radio Satellite Group. It has actually three nets available in Dallas residence Tuesday evenings. You can go to Echolink, and uh, if you have it installed and you registered, you can find the group under Echolink as AMSAT. There's a live audio link also available on the AMSATnet.com website. Also, Dallas AMSAT Net East is on this repeater every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Tom and 5 hyp is net control, and are welcome to check in. Uh, the only one, only time it is not is when it's the first Tuesday of the month, which will be a week from Tuesday of this uh, coming up. Uh, then there's no AMSAT Net East. But you can always catch AMSAT Net West on Wednesday evenings at 9 p.m., a little later on the Arlington repeater. They're at 147.140 megahertz with a PL of 110.9 with a positive offset. Uh, that one's also hosted by Tom uh, and 5 hyp So if you got questions, we got answers. Don't forget about the DARC and all the nets that it has. Uh, coming up on Monday, uh, well, on Mondays, let's see, we will be in the fourth week. Yes, the fourth week. So coming up on Monday will be GeekNet. So if you have a question, that's at 7 p.m. Uh, anything that uh, has to do with geek, it could be computers, could be ham radio, obviously might even be a puzzler or two. There certainly will be uh, some interesting geeky things to discuss and news items. So uh, come to that net. I'm fixing the third week. Geek net, fourth week. And if there is a fifth week, we have a surprise net. If we told you what it is, it wouldn't be a surprise.
We have on Fridays at 8 p.m. the CERT City Simulation. This is the emergency radio communications with CERT trained amateur radio operators. That one is uh, hosted by Melissa, KF5GRH, um, and she'll talk about the, the most disaster prone city in the universe, CERT City, every Friday night. You're always welcome to attend. Saturdays are a big night. We have TechNet from 7 to 8 o'clock. That's all amateur radio stuff. There's even a swap meet in there, too. Uh, Skynet at 9 o'clock to 10.30. And then also uh, we have the Afterglow Movie Net, which I'm going to tell you about here in a few minutes. That's at 10.30 immediately following this net. On the first and third Sundays, Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting on the air or MOTA. It's the information net, telling you all about what the club does and who uh, maintains the repeater that you're on right now. Daily at 6.30 p.m., we have the ARRL National Traffic System Training Net. Training Net, if you've never been on a formalized uh, net, uh, either on HF or on uh, DHF, UHF, then this is the net to uh, tune in on. You can't make a mistake because it's a training net. Now I'll go ahead and tell you about uh, tonight's Afterglow movie with my highly accurate information on the movie. Uh, Miles Harding, a nerd of the First Order, had seen 2001 A Space Odyssey a million times, but it had never registered that Hal had it in for Dave Bowman. Miles, in short, was a nerd, but he was also an idiot. Miles brought every, bought every accessory he could for his new computer, and his computer liked it. A lot. In a matter of a few days, he demanded dinner out, a vacation to Puerto Rico, and fancy clothing it couldn't even wear. It was when his computer wouldn't open the garage door that Miles and until Miles complied with its demands that the famous SF film finally registered in his head. Join us for Electric Dreams from 1984 tonight at 10.30 p.m. on the Afterglow movie net. You can keep up with all uh, DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, which is whiskey5friedchicken.org. That's w5fc.org. Now, does anyone need any fills? All right, next up is National... Let me try this again. We have barking dogs tonight. Uh, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas, uh, where and when you can look through a telescope, I believe uh, Chaz will probably handle that, KF5JAJ. Let's find out if you have a voice tonight. Uh, please go ahead with your announcements. Thank you, Tom. I think I was doubled with a couple times during check-in. The next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas club meeting will be held, well, actually, the last one is held last night, and it was a great meeting. But the next one is going to be held on Friday, September the 22nd, and the meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Texas at Dallas, and also held on Zoom. The featured speaker is Lisa Actor from Lowell Observatory. I'm not sure about what her topic is going to be. Now, the Saturday public observing sessions have begun again. The Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there would be an opportunity for reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Public Observing Station. Now, tonight, on the fourth Saturday, the stargazing would have been held at Rockwall, but tonight's stargazing was canceled due to the heat. So check the TAS website, texasastro.org, for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing stations. And this is KF5JJ. Yes, I'm on the third planet. Thank you, Chess. Does anybody need any pills on that or have any questions? Please come with your call. KI5ZOE. KI5ZOE. Tommy, go ahead. Hey, Chaz. Uh, actually, I went to the official calendar at the TexasAstro.org site, and they said that they would update the calendar if it was canceled by 6 p.m. After about 6.15, I noticed that there wasn't any such, uh, any such uh, cancellation, so I actually went to Rockwall, which is a 26-minute drive from my place, just to 
check it out. So I arrived there, and uh, one thing I noticed is that uh, sunset wasn't until 8 p.m., and the star party, according to the calendar, was from 6.45 till 9. But I did get a great view of the biggest star in the sky. You know what that is. It's Sol, our very own sun. And then after the sunset at about getting close to uh, 8.30, I was able to see Mars just barely over the horizon, and I could barely make out Vega, but the sky was still a little bit of an afterglow. So I wasn't able to see much of anything except for the moon, which was, was quite, quite evident. I didn't bother to bring my telescope. I brought my dog because I was skeptical uh, if there was going to be a meeting. Uh, reset. Uh, and, and there wasn't, there weren't any other telescopes there or any other people, but me and my dog enjoyed the park. And we'll be back uh, again next month and uh, hopefully bringing our telescopes. But whoever uh, handles the calendar, it'd be a good, good idea to either update it or uh, come up with some other way to, uh, to uh, send out the, the word when it's canceled. KF5COE. KF5 JHA. All right, very good. Thank you all. Let's see. Next up is National Space Society Events and Activities. Uh, that one would be Bill, and I think he did check in. Yeah, he's number 11 on my list. Bill, N5BB, what do you got for us this evening? Um, uh, this is in for BB. Um, hang on a second while I get off of Echo Link and go back over to RF. I just posted some things on the uh, script also. Hang on. Okay, this is in five BB. Um, uh, sorry about that. My computer is in a different room, and so I had Echolink running in there, and I needed to run back in here where the radio is. Um, I happen to be the membership director uh, and member at large of the North Texas chapter of the National Space Society. We've had a lot of activities going on. Uh, the ones I'm going to mention here were mentioned last week, but I'm mentioning them again. Yesterday, we had our monthly uh, Space Rendezvous, which is a social event for anybody interested in space. You don't have to be a member of the National Space Society. And uh, we meet normally at the 54th Street uh, Grill restaurant on um, Highway 635 in Irving, uh, near Olympus. This is about a mile west of MacArthur at 6 p.m. on the last Friday of every month. If you uh, uh, have any interest in that, you can contact me, my email to come in just a moment. Today we had the uh, Fort Worth Museum of Science History and History had their Space Day event, which is very big. There's people over there with uh, lots of other things about space and National Space Society. We had how many people there? A number of them. One, two, three, six, I believe. Something like that. We had quite a few people. We weren't all there at one time, six or seven. We were there at different times. But uh, we had uh, a good showing, and uh, we saw a lot of kids. We were at the Noble Planetarium right outside it on the second level of the Fourth Museum of Science and History which is in the museum district in, in Fort Worth. Again, that event is over. It was yesterday. I mean, excuse me, it was today, and it's finished. Uh, there's another event a week from tonight, today. Uh, this is in 5BB. Next Saturday, which is September the 2nd. My, the year goes by fast. There will be a... Uh, uh, the National Space Society, North Texas chapter, will be at the space exhibit at Garland City Hall. This is a traveling NASA exhibit, 
and it has um, uh, various information about the manned space programs up to now, uh, the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo space shuttle programs from NASA, and it has information locally created about the various local companies that were instrumental in putting things into those main manned space programs in the past. So it's a pretty neat exhibit there. It's free. It's in Garland City Hall. And the last day it will be there is next Saturday, September the 2nd. So I recommend you come by next Saturday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. at Garland City Hall. The location is 200 North 5th Street. That's 200 North 5th Street, Garland, 75040. The National Space Society North Texas Chapter meets on the second Sunday afternoon of every month. Our next meeting will be on Sunday, September the 10th at 3.30 p.m. at Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving on Highway 183 in Beltline. Oh, this is in 5BB. Uh, the speaker is... Um, let me get her name pronounced correctly. It's Kamisha Simmons. She is speaking about private property rights in outer space, the great debate. She has quite a bit of knowledge about this. She is a lawyer, and um, uh, she spoke about this topic, was part of the panel speaking about it at the International Space Development Conference in Frisco back in late May. So she's very, very uh, familiar with all these things, autonomous accords and various private property rights in outer space. So it should be a very interesting uh, uh, meeting. Again, uh, you can be there as a visitor if you'd like to be. We also are try to do a hybrid meeting. So I try to broadcast to sp sp spit this out on WebEx also, audio and visual. So if you'd like to participate in any way, either in person or on WebEx, please contact me, Bill Byram, N5BB, at November 5, Bravo, Bravo, N5BB, at ARRL.net, or space at Byram.net, S-P-A-C-E at B-Y-R-O-M dot N-E-T, uh, you can also find my email address up on QRZ. And if you know my phone number, you can call or text me. Um, one more item related to National Space Society and other things space-wise. Michelle Hanlon, who is the immediate past president of the National Space Society. We have a new president uh, since earlier this year, uh, and, but the, uh, the immediate past president is Michelle Hanlon. She is a space lawyer and based over in Mississippi, University of Mississippi, I believe. Uh, she, uh, was, she spoke on some panels at the International Space Development Conference in Frisco this year about the Artemis Accords and space law. To, uh, yesterday, she was interviewed by National Public Radio. And it was a very nice thing talking about the Indigo landing on the moon, the attempted Russian landing, the, the, uh, our Artemis program going to the moon by NASA. This is in 5 bb And then Michelle Hanlon was interviewed, and she talked about why we're going to the South Pole of the moon, the reasons we're going there, about private property interests, about the Artemis Accords that governs things between countries, about the current little bit of a space race between China and the U.S. and other countries for the moon. So you can listen to this, and Tom, I posted this up on, right before I started speaking here, I posted this up on the script. So I hope you can go there and make sure it made it in there in the NSS area. There's a link there uh, which others are welcome to look to. That is the link to the National Public Radio uh, podcast little thing. It's about 
I think, 10, ten minutes long, something like that, um, about uh, uh, space law and the Artemis Accords and everything and the uh, recent uh, lunar landings. Anyway, so uh, space is big on on National Public Radio uh, yesterday and today. That that particular little little sex, uh, session, that, that, that section that they uh, broadcast, was broadcast yesterday and again this afternoon on NPR, at KERA 90.1 locally. And that's all I've got, Tom, a lot of activities. If anybody has any questions, please contact me. Again, N5BB at ARRL.net. This is N5BB. That's all. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for all the information you brought. Sounds very, very interesting. There's a lot of space going on here in the local Dallas area. Thanks once again. Okay, uh, tonight, normally this would be um, Billy's night at KFI PDS, but she is uh, indisposed this evening, so I took over for her uh, as net control. As net control, I get to talk about whatever I want. So tonight topic has to do with one of my favorite movies of all time, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which, by the way, was the Afterglow movie from last week. So, giving it, I thought, well, what the heck, there's a, a wiki uh, article about the accuracy of 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, taking into, into consideration that even though the movie is 2001, it actually was filmed and, and uh premiered in 1968, so it actually took two years to make the film. But I think you'll find this interesting. It's a lot of good information about how the film uh, was made technically and how accurate it was. So, or I should say, what technical aspects of the film were accurate and which ones weren't. So that's what we're going to go through. So I'll go ahead and get started and explain. It says here, the 1968 science fiction film 2001 A Space Odyssey featured numerous fictional future technologies which have proved and quiescent in light of subsequent developments around the world. Before the film's production, and a number of them submitted their ideas to Kubrick of what kind of products might be seen in a movie set in the year, in a movie that is set in the year 2001. The film is also praised for its accurate portrayal of space flight and vacuum. Two thousand and one is, according to four NASA engineers who based their nuclear propulsion spacecraft design in part on the film's Discovery One, perhaps the most thoroughly and accurately researched film in screen history with respect to aerospace engineering. Several technical advisors were hired for two thousand and one, some of whom were recommended by co screenwriter Arthur C. Clarke, who himself had a background in aerospace. Advisors included Marshall Space Flight Center engineer Frederick Ordway who worked on the film for two years, and I.J. Good, whom Kubrick consulted on supercomputers because Good's authorship on treaties such as speculations concerning the first ultra-intelligent machine and logic of man and machine. We also had Dr. Marvin Minsky of MIT with the main artificial intelligence advisor on the film. Now, bear in mind, this is 1966 through 68. Two thousand and one accurate really presents outer space as not allowing the propagation of sound in sharp contrast to other films with space scenes with explosions and sounds of passing spacecraft are heard. Two thousand and one's portrayal of weightlessness in spaceships and outer space is more realistic. Tracking shots inside the rotating wheel providing artificial gravity contrast with the weightlessness outside the wheel during the repair and house disconnection scene scenes of the astronauts in the Discovery Pod Bay, along with earlier scenes involving shuttle flight attendants, depict walking in zero gravity with the help of Velcro-equipped shoes labeled grip shoes. Other aspects that contribute to the film's realism are the depiction of a time delay in conversations between the astronauts and Earth to the extreme distance between the two, which the BBC announcer explains have been edited out of the broadcast. The attention to small details, such as the sound of breathing inside the spacesuit, 
uplifting spatial orientation of astronauts inside a zero-gravity spaceship, and enormous size of Jupiter in relation to the spaceship. The general approach to how space travel is engineered is highly accurate. In particular, the design of the spaceships was based on actual engineering considerations rather than attempts to look aesthetically futuristic. Many other science fiction films give spacecraft an aerodynamic shape, which is superfluous in outer space, except for the craft such as the Pan Am shuttle that are designed to function both in the atmosphere and in space. Kubrick science advisor, uh, Frederick Ordway, notes that in designing the spacecraft, he says, we insisted on knowing the purpose and functioning of each assembly and component down to the logical labeling of individual buttons and the presentation on screens of plausible operating and diagnostics and other data. Onboard equipment and panels on various spaceships had specific purposes, such as alarms, communications, condition displays, docking, diagnostics, navigations, and the designs of which relied heavily on NASA's input. Aerospace specialists were also consulted on design of the spacesuits and space helmets. The space dock at Moon Base Clavius shows multiple underground layers which could sustain high levels of air pressure, typical of Earth. The lunar craft design takes into account the lower gravity and lighting conditions on the moon. The Jupiter-bound Discovery is meant to be powered by a nuclear reactor at its rear, separated from the crew area at the front of by hundreds of feet of fuel storage compartments. Although difficult to be recognized as such, actual nuclear reactor control panel displays appear in the astronaut's control area. The suspended animation of the three astronauts on board is accurately portrayed as worked out by consulting medical authorities. Such hibernation would likely be necessary to conserve resources on a flight of this kind, as Clark's novelization implies. The depiction of early hominoids was based on the writings of anthropologists such as Louis Leakey. The sequence, here's something on some of the uh, uh, sequences that were in the space uh, in, in the movie. A sequence in which Bowman re-enters Discovery shows him holding his breath just before ejecting from the pod into an emergency airlock. Doing this before exposure into a vacuum instead of exhaling would in reality re rupture the lungs. In an interview on the 2007 DVD release of the film, Clark states that it, had he been on the set the day they filmed this, he would have caught this error. And now I'm talking about the things that uh, were not accurate in the film. That was one of them, the rapid decompression. Next up was walking on the moon. When spacecraft land on the moon in the film, uh, dust is shown billowing as it would in the air, not moving in a sheet as it would in the vacuum of the lunar surface, as it would be seen in the Apollo lunar landing footage. While on the moon, all actors move as if they were in normal Earth gravity, not as they would in one-sixth gravity of the moon, which we do know when we watch the, uh, any of the videos of, the, of walking on the moon. Similarly, the behavior of Dave and Frank in the weightless pot bay is not consistent with zero-g environment. Although the astronauts are wearing zero-g grips and shoes in order to walk normally, they are oddly leaning on the table while testing the AE-35 unit as if held down by gravity. Finally, in an environment with a radius as small as the main quarters, the simulated gravity would vary significantly from the center of the crew quarters to the floor, even varying between feet, waist, and head. The rotation speed of the crew quarters was meant to only be fast enough to generate an approximation of the moon's gravity, not that of Earth. However, Clark felt that this was enough to prevent the physical atrophy that would result in complete weightlessness. And the space station under construction. During Lloyd's approach to the space station, parts of the spinning wheel appear to be under construction, consisting of nothing more than bare internal structure. Geophysicist Dr. David Stevenson in the Canadian TV documentary 2001 and Beyond notes that every engineer that saw it, the space station, had a fit. You do not spin on a wheel that is not fully built. You have to finish it before you spin it, or else you'll have real problems.
also now about imagining the future in the tech. Over 50 organizations contributed technical advice and production, and a number of them submitted their ideas to Kubrick of what kind of products might be seen in a movie set in, the, uh, in a movie set in the year 2001. Much was made by MGM's publicity department of the film's realism, claiming in a 1968 brochure that everything in 2001 A Space Odyssey can happen within the next three decades, and most of the picture will happen by the beginning of the next millennium. Although the predictions central to the plot, a colonization of moon, manned interplanetary travel, and artificial intelligence did not materialize by that date, some of the film's other futuristic elements have been realized. One is the depiction of computers. As the central character of the Jupiter mission segment of the film, Hal was shown by Cooper to have as much intelligence as human beings, possibly more, while sharing their same emotional potentialities. Kubrick agreed that computer theorists who believe that highly intelligent computers that can learn by experience will inevitably develop emotions such as fear, love, hate, and envy. Such a machine, he said, would eventually manifest human mental disorders as well, such as a nervous breakdown, as Hal did in the film. Clark noted that contrary to popular rumor, it was a complete coincidence that the, each of the letters of Hal's name immediately preceded those of IBM in the alphabet. The meaning of Hal has been both has been given both as heuristically programmed algorithmic computer and as heuristically algorithmic computer. The former appears in Clark's novel 2001 and the latter in his sequel novel 2010. In computer science, a heuristic is a programmable procedure not necessarily based on fixed rules, producing informed guesses, often using trial and error. The results could be false, such as predictions of the stock market, sports scores, or the weather. Sometimes this can entail selecting on the fly one of several methods to solve a problem based on previous experience. On the other hand, an algorithm is a programmable procedure that produces reprodu reproducible results using invariant-established method, invariant established methods, such as computing square roots. A heuristic approach that usually works within a tolerable margin of error may be preferred over a perfect algorithm that requires a long time to run. During Apple and Samsung's patent war uh, over consumer electronics designs, this is tablets in space, by the way, in 2011, Samsung used a still image from the scene in which two astronauts are eating at a table and what appears to be a tablet computers as an exhibit to counter Apple's patent, claiming the original abstract design of the tablet computers. Common 21st century computer technology not depicted in this film included keyboards, mice, mobile phones, touch screens, interfaces with windows, menus, and icons. Although there are devices that resemble tablet computers, they are only used in the film as portable video screens. Now on to the, uh, the vehicles that were in 2001. They were all designed with extreme care in order for the small-scale models as well as full-scale interiors to appear realistic. The modeling team was led by Kubrick's two hirees from NASA, science advisors, advisors Fred Ordway and production designer Harry Lang, uh, along with Anthony Masters, who was responsible for turning Lang's 2D sketches into models. Ordway and Lang insisted on knowing the purpose and function of each assembly and component down to the labeling of individual buttons and presentations on screen, possible operating diagnostics, and other data. Kubrick's team of 35 designers, which often was often frustrated by script changes done after designs for various spacecraft had been completed. Douglas Trumbull, chief special effects supervisor, writes one of the, the most serious problems that plagued us throughout the production was simply keeping track of all the ideas, shots, and changes, and constantly reevaluating and updating designs, storyboards, and the script itself. To handle all this, a control room was to handle all this, a control room was used to keep track of all progress on the film. Fordway, who worked on designing the station and the five principal space vehicles, has noted that US industry had problems satisfying 
Kubrick with equipment suggestions while design suspects aspects of the vehicles had to be updated often to accommodate rapid screenplay changes. One crew member resi resigning over an unspecified related issue. Eventual con eventually conflicting ideas of what Kubrick had in mind and what Clark was writing and equipment and particular realities emerging from Ortway, Lang and Masters and construction supervisor Dick Frift and his team were resolved and coalesced into the final design and construction of the spacecraft before beginning uh, in December of 1965. One futuristic device that was shown in the film already under development when the film was released in 1968 was a voice print identification. The first prototype was released in 76. A credible prototype of chess playing computer already existed in 68 even though it could be defeated by experts, computers did not defeat champions until the 1980s. While 10 digit phone numbers for long distance and national dialing originated in 51, longer phone numbers for international dialing became a reality in 1970. Installation of personal in flight entertainment displays by major airlines began in the early mid 1990s, offering video games, TV broadcasts, and movies in a manner similar to Shonen's real world prototype appeared. 1972, produced by Westinghouse, but was not used for broadcast television until 1998. Also known as glass cockpits, the plane cockpit integrated systems uh, were introduced in the 1970s in Langley's Boeing 737 Flying Laboratory. Today, such cockpits appear not only in high-tech aircraft like the Boeing 777, but also been employed in space shuttles, the first being Atlantis in 1985. Rudimentary voice controls of computing began in the 1980s with the soft voice computer system and existed in more sophisticated form the early 2000s. And then, uh, let's see, oh, I'm almost done. I was worried I may be going a little long, but we're okay. Uh, personal audio wireless telephones were ubiquitous in 2001, yet no one in the movies had such a small personal communication device. Some technologies portrayed as common in the film which is not materialized in 2000, included commonplace civilian space travel, space stations with hotels, moon colonization, suspended animation of humans, practical nuclear propulsion in spacecraft, and strong artificial intelligence, the kind displayed by HAL. There are also corporate logos and entities in the film that either didn't exist, no longer exist, or were broken up by antitrust lawsuits. Still others changed their business and model and represent countries that no longer, com I think represent companies that no longer exist. They wrote it. The British Broadcasting Corporation never expanded to have BBC 12. BBC 3 and 4 came into existence in 2003 and 2, respectively, and newer channels were used, such as used names such as BBC News and BBC Parliament. The corporations, IBM, Aeroflot, Howard Johnson, Whirlpool Corporation, Hilton Hotels, visual references of which, of which appear in the film, and I have a shot of that uh, on the video screen, which shows a whole bunch of them all together in one scene. Um, although 2001, Howard Johnson had switched his business focus to hotels rather than restaurants shown in the film. The film depicts a still existing Pan Am, which went out of business in 1991, and still existing Bell System Telephone Company, uh, which had broken up in 1984 as the result of an anti-monopoly lawsuit filed by the U.S. Justice Department. The Bell System logo, as seen in the film, was modified in 1959 and dropped entirely in 1983. So there you have it, the supposed and real future uh, that is now our history and past. Um, kind of was interesting. Um, I've been thinking about the film all week because it is one of my favorites and I hadn't seen it in a while. We had a wonderful, lively discussion. Um, if you're interested, come by tonight at 10.30 p.m. We'll be talking about electron electric dreams and that does have something to do with artificial intelligence. Uh, you can come by you can bring up your points to decide if it's that good or not. To that. This is KE5ICX and Net Control for tonight's Skynet. I'm going to go ahead and take additional check-ins at this point before we move to the next section of the net. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign, phonetically your name, and where you're transmitting from. Hello there, 
five Oscar thoughts right. Clay in the seat. Uh, amazing detail of movement. November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia in Fort Worth. Kilo Bravo 9, Sarah Oscar Kilo, shot in Fort Worth. Okay, I don't know if the doubles resolve themselves, but let me go ahead and get who I've got. I've got N5OF, Clay and Mesquite, NB5F, that's Virginia and Fort Worth, NT5TM, Tony and Dallas, K5JDW, John and Coppell, KB5SOK, Sean and Fort Worth. Anyone else? Kilo Charlie 5, Mike, Papa, Oscar, Jamie, North Dallas. And we pick up KC5MPO, uh, Jamie, over in North Dallas. Very good. Okay, well, we're up to 20 check-ins, not too bad. The Cowboys game is over, so I think we're getting some check-ins now. Uh, next up is Was Up. That is Chaz again, KF5JHA. So, Chaz, uh, you're on, my friend, from ke 5 ICX. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I want to apologize for uh, the person that went out to the Rockwall stargazing that got canceled. I am sorry. I will pass that information along that the website was not updated. So thank you. This is Jazz KF5JHA. We call this segment of Skynet Was Up because it's all about what's going on astronomically over the next couple of weeks. That was slide number one. Slide master, that would be Tom. Slide number two, please. On August 24th was the first quarter phase of the moon. That was just a couple days ago. So the current phase of the moon is a waxing gibbous. On August the 30th, the moon is at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 357,181 kilometers. And on August 30th is the second, uh, excuse me, oh, yes, uh, August the 30th is the second full moon of the month of August. This is oftentimes called a blue moon. A blue moon only happens about every three years or so. Now, the last blue moon we had was on October 31st, 2020. On September the 6th, the moon phase will be the third quarter. On September the 12th, the moon will be at its apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 406,291 kilometers. The moon will be new on September the 14th. Slide master, slide number three, please. On August the 28th, in the early morning eastern sky, the asteroid Vesta and the Crab Nebula, also known as M1, will only be about two degrees apart from each other. Now, a pair of binoculars is all that you need to require to observe both if you're away from the city lights. Now, inside the city, it'll be difficult to see the Crab Nebula with just a pair of binoculars. But if you have computer software and a telescope, you should be able to see Vesta with just a pair of binoculars and then you'd need a telescope for the Crab Nebula. That might even be difficult inside the city because of the city lights. Slide master, slide number four. On August the 30th, the moon and Saturn will be found in conjunction in the southern sky just after midnight. Remember that August 30th is also the blue moon. Just talked about that. Slide master, slide number five. On the night of August 31st through September the 1st, the rigged meteor shower peaks with about half a dozen meteors per hour. Now, you can get more information about meteors and meteor showers at the International Meteor Organization, IMO.net, or the American Meteor Society at AMSmeteors.org. Slide master, slide number six, please. On September the 1st, the moon and Neptune 
will uh, be in conjunction in the morning sky. Slide master slide number seven on September the 4th, the moon and Jupiter are in conjunction in the morning sky. And slide number eight, just the very next night, or morning I should say, uh, that would be September the 5th, the moon, the planet Uranus, and M45 are in conjunction in the morning sky. Now, if you want to find Neptune or Uranus, you're going to need a uh, telescope or binoculars. Uh, binoculars for Uranus is possible, but Neptune itself, if you're trying to find that on September the 1st, well, you're going to need a telescope. Slide master, slide number nine. Remember that we have two solar eclipses coming up very soon. Kelly uh, talked about that earlier, K5, KTX. The solar eclipse is when the moon is in between the Earth and the sun. And for a few people that are lucky on the Earth, annual solar eclipse for us here in North Texas. But along a path in West Texas and into New Mexico, there's a path where the moon will block out all but just a ring or annulus of sunlight from our, uh, from the field of view. The eclipse here in uh, North Texas uh, begins at 10.30 a.m., around 10.30 a.m. Uh, the middle of the eclipse is at 11.52 a.m., which is about 81% of the sun being covered up by the moon. That's a lot. And the eclipse ends at 1.29 p.m. Now, those times are good for uh, Brookhaven Campus. That's where I work. Slide master, slide number 11, please. On April the 8th, 2024, the total solar eclipse is what we can see here in North Texas. Now, from Brickhaven campus, the sun will be completely blocked out for around 3 minutes and 20 seconds between 1.41 and 1.44 p.m. We call that time totality. That's when you'll be able to see stars in the sky, just as if it were evening twilight. Now, the next total solar eclipse visual in North Texas will be on July the 9th, the year 2317. So the total solar eclipse on April the 8th is a very big deal. So this only happens about once every 300 years here in North Texas. Wow. And this is KF5, JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 12. Once again, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, September 22nd. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Texas at Dallas and also held on Zoom. Future speaker will be Lisa Actor from Lowell Observatory. That should be interesting. And, of course, Saturday night public observing sessions have begun, but you know, the one tonight was canceled because of the heat. If you want to get more information about the Texas Astronomical Society, texasastro.org, and that gives you meeting details and public observing sessions, and they run by volunteers, so hopefully they get updated on a regular basis. Slide master, slide number 13. Now, do any of you out there in Radio Land have any questions or need a fill on any of the information I've given you? Or maybe you just have a general astronomy question. Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need a fill. KI5ZOE, reach out. ZOE, please come with a question or fill that you need. Hey, Chaz. Hey, one other thing that you might want to mention if you're going to talk to anybody about the uh, party on the rock and rock wall is that the park is actually open until 10 p.m. And the reason I would consider that to be an important piece of information is because the official uh, star party is says to close at 9 p.m. Well, when the sun sets at 8 o'clock and your twilight is until 8.30 and you can barely see anything there, 9 o'clock seems a bit early. I think if I was to bring my telescope out there, I would stay after the star party because uh, you'd be able to see much more uh, as it gets deeper into the night up until the, the park closes. KF5 is the Thank you so much. I have a feeling it hadn't been updated for a while. I'll bet that was the winter time time. I mean, from several months ago. So, yeah, I will pass that along to several different people. I think I'll send an email to about half a dozen people. Thank you so much. All right, slide master, slide number 14. So as the moon wanes, 
so do these. Oh, well, we'll be waning in a couple of weeks. So do these words for the segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live, at least right now. And until next time, well, I'll be doing another segment of Skynet in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KFI, JHA, back to our net control. I believe that's Tom, K-E-5-I-C-X. Should I call you the founder? I don't know about that, Chaz. Maybe lost and found or something like that. I spent most of my time lost. Ask around. They'll tell you that. Okay, this is KE5 ICX. I am net control for tonight's Skynet. I'll go ahead and ask uh, if anybody else would like to check in. Please come down with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. Okay, I think we've tapped that one. So let's go to Miss Kelly, K5KTX. Uh, you have something for us on space exploration and space history. That is yours. Hey, Tom. This is K5KTX. Good evening, everyone. Well, an international crew of four representing four countries is in orbit following a successful launch to the International Space Station at 3.27 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time this morning from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, which is her, this is her first flight, but she is the commander. Uh, the European Space Agency astronaut Andreas Mogensen, who's on his second mission and is the pilot. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa uh, on his second mission and Konstantin Borsov of the Roscosmos on his first mission lifted off from Launch Complex 39A this morning um, to perform research technology demonstrations and maintenance activities aboard the microgravity laboratory. The flight is the seventh crew rotation mission uh, with SpaceX to station and the eighth human space flight as part of NASA's commercial crew program. The international crew are aboard the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft named Endurance, which previously flew NASA's Crew-3 and Crew-5 missions. The Dragon spacecraft will dock autonomously to the space facing port of the station's Harmony module at 8.39 a.m. tomorrow morning. NASA television, the NASA app, and the agency's website will provide live coverage of docking and hatch opening. NASA also will cover the welcome remarks by crew aboard the orbital outpost at 11.30 a.m. Crew 7 will conduct new scientific research to prepare for human exploration beyond low orbit Earth and benefit humanity on Earth. Experiments will include the collection of microbial samples from the exterior of the space station, the first study of human response to different spaceflight durations, and an investigation of the physiological aspects of astronaut sleep. These are just a few of the more than 200 science experiments and technology demonstrations that will take place during their missions. While aboard the orbiting laboratory, Crew-7 will see the arrival of both the SpaceX Dragon and the Roscosmos Progress cargo spacecraft. Crew-7 also is expected to welcome the agency's Boeing crew flight test astronauts, the Axiom Mission 3 crew, and the first cargo flight of Sierra Space's Dream Chaser during their expedition. The Soyuz spacecraft with three new crew members also is planned for launch during their stay, and the Soyuz carrying NASA astronauts Frank Rubio and Ross Cosmos, cosmonaut Sergei Prokofiev and Dmitry Petlin will depart after 371 days on the station. Now in space history this past week, talking about a couple of solar eclipses, August the 21st, 1914. On August the 21st, 1914, a total solar eclipse temporarily darkened skies across Europe and Asia. A young German astronomer and friend of Albert Einstein's, Erwin Finlay Frundlich, 
that would verify Albert Einstein's general relativity theory. This theory predicted that the light from distant stars appearing very close to the sun's edge should shift due to the curvature of space. Those stars would only be visible during a total solar eclipse when the moon blocks out the sun's bright light. Unfortunately, the start of World War I, just 20 days before the eclipse, foiled the expedition. After Germany declared war on Germany, Frumlich and his colleagues were captured by the Russian army and their equipment was confiscated. After the war, a solar eclipse on May 29, 1919, was used to confirm Einstein's theory of relativity, so the experiment was ultimately a success. Of course, who could forget August 21st, 2017, just six years ago, a solar eclipse dubbed the Great American Eclipse by the media was a total solar eclipse visible within a band that spanned the entire contiguous United States, passing from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast. As a partial solar eclipse, it was visible on land from Nunavut in northern Canada to as far south as northern South America. In northwestern Europe and Africa, it was partially visible in the late evening. In northeastern Asia, it was partially visible at sunrise. Prior to this event, no solar eclipse had been visible across the entire United States since June 8, 1918. Not since the February 1979 eclipse had a total eclipse been visible from anywhere in the mainland United States. The path of totality touched 14 states, and the rest of the U.S. had a partial eclipse. The event's shadow began to cover land on the Oregon coast as a partial eclipse at 9.05 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. The total eclipse's land coverage ended along the South Carolina coast at about 2.44 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Well, who could forget this day back on August 24, 2006? For 76 years, school children were taught that our solar system had nine planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. 16, um, let's see, that would be 17 years ago on August 24, 2006. Pluto lost its planetary status and the world's perception of our solar system changed. The International Astronomical Union, IAU, is the official entity responsible for naming and classifying all bodies in outer space. And when they met in Prague, Czech Republic, in August of 2006, there was a vigorous debate about the definition of objects in our solar system. At the end of the meeting, the IAU voted to classify a planet as a celestial body that A, is in orbit around the sun, B, has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rich body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium, nearly round shape, and C, has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. Pluto meets the first two criteria, but not the third, so it falls into the new category of dwarf planets. While the definition of a planet remains stable for most of the 20th century, objects in our solar system have been recategorized before. For example, Ceres was officially classified as a planet, but was later redesignated as an asteroid. Under the new definition, it is now a dwarf planet. August the 25th, back in 2003, the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched from Cape Canaveral. It was the fourth and final of the NASA Great Observatories program. It was named for astronaut Lyman Spitzer, astronomer Lyman Spitzer, who first promoted the concept of a space telescope in the 1940s. The planned mission was to be two and a half years. The mission ended on January the 30th, 2020. On this date, August the 26th, back in 1918, was the birthday of NASA research mathematician Katherine Johnson. Johnson, whose story is recounted in Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures, was one of the women who worked on the computations for early space flights. From a young age, she was on track to make history, graduating from high school at age 14 and college at 18. 
she worked as a teacher and stay-at-home mother for a number of years. Then in 1953, she began working for the NACA as one of the female mathematicians known as computers. At NASA Langley Research Center, she calculated trajectories for Alan Shepard and John Glenn's Mercury missions. Her work on orbital rendezvous calculations was fundamental to the success of the Apollo lunar missions. Johnson worked as a mathematician for NASA until 1986. In 2015, President Barack Obama awarded her a Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. She passed away on February 24, 2020, at the age of 101. And by the way, I just finally finished reading the book, Hidden Figures, and it was terrific. So, um, highly recommended. And finally, we have a bunch of astronaut birthdays for this past week, so I'm going to try to get through these pretty quickly. Starting with August the 22nd, 1932, Gerald Carr, who was on Skylab 4. August the 23rd, 1956, David Wolf, Space Shuttle Missions, STS-58, 8689, Mir-24, um, STS-112, and STS-127. Also on August the 23rd, 1967, Dominic Antonelli, who was part of Space Shuttle Missions STS-119 and 132. August the 24th, 1944, Gregory Jarvis. Uh, he was on the ill-fated Challenger mission STS-51L. August 24th, 1946, Richard Richards, Space Shuttle Missions uh, STS-28, 41, 50, and 64. August the 24th, 1949, Anna Lee Fisher, Space Shuttle Mission STS-51A, who she was the first mother in space. August the 24th, 1960, Steve Lindsay, Space Shuttle Missions STS-87, 95, 104, 121, and 133. August the 24th, 1962, Mary Ellen Weber, Space Shuttle Missions STS-70 and STS-101. Rounding out our uh, astronaut birthdays for this past week, August the 25th, 1960, Lee R. Schombolt, uh, Space Shuttle Missions STS-117 and 119. Also August 25th, 1965, Andrew Fossil, Space Shuttle Missions STS-125 and 134, and he was part of Expedition 55 and 56 not too long ago. August the 26th, today, 1932, Joe Engel, who was on three X-15 flights and also part of STS Mission 2 and 51I. Also, August the 26th, 1942, John Blaha, Space Shuttle Missions STS-29, 33, 43, 58, 79, and 81 as part of Mir-22. And finally, August the 26th, 1959, Catherine Heyer, Space Shuttle Missions STS-90 and 130. And that's all I've got this evening. Back to you, Tom. This is K5KTX. Thank you, Ms. Kelly, and a uh, great presentation this evening. Appreciate it very much. Lots of astronauts uh, were born uh, this week. Uh, this is uh, KE5ICX on control for tonight. Skynet. Next up is Chaz again. Chaz, run back to your radio. Uh, it's time to talk about Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week. K5JHA, you are on. Thanks, Tom. Slide number 15, please. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key, Carolyn KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019 with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in North Texas throughout the year out of the 88 total number of constellations, so Ms. Carolyn covered the entire sky seen over North Texas in a year. And in her honor, we have continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. So Ms. Carolyn's constellation of the week this week is Aquila the Eagle. 
The constellation name Aquila means the eagle in Latin. The constellation represents the eagle of the Roman god Jupiter in mythology. The constellation was first cataloged by the Greek astronomer Ptolemy in the second century. The Greek mythology Aquila is identified as the eagle that carried Zeus's thunderbolt and was once dispatched by the god to carry Ganymede, the young Tro uh, Trojan boy Zeus desired to Olympus to be the cupbearer. Aquarius. We've heard of that constellation before, haven't we? Slide master, slide number 16, please. The joke of the week. Now, you can either laugh, groan, boo, or hiss. That's fine. Uh, what bird doesn't need a comb? No, it's not a rooster because it already has a comb. No, no, no. What bird does not need a comb is a bald eagle. Oh, that was funny. What does the eagle say to his friends before they go out hunting for food? They say, let us pray. How does an eagle greet its prey? Please to eat you. What is an eagle's favorite game? Beak a boo. What do you call a sick eagle? Well, that would be an illegal. And the last one in this segment. Why is the eagle considered the most skillful, skillful bird? Because it is the most talented. We have a tour bus parked outside the apartment complex. I don't know what's going on. They're driving away now. Slide master, slide number 17. So driven away with the jokes. They, they left as soon as my jokes were over. Altair, Alpha Aquilae, is the brightest star in Aquilus. Uh, it's the 12th brightest star in the sky. Altair is one of the three stars that make up the Summer Triangle, the second brightest member of the three. The name Altair is derived from the Arabic words meaning the flying eagle. Altair is an A-type white star located only 17 light years from the Earth. Altair is one of the few stars that has been directly imaged. Um, yes, you can actually see its size. Yes, image. A copy of the image can be found on page 7 of the volume 2 of the Annals of uh, Deep Space by Jeff Kneipp and Dennis Webb. It may also be found on Wikipedia underneath Altair. Altair is noted as extremely fast rotating period of about 6.5 hours. You understand our sun rotates in about 24 days. It, it depends whether you're looking toward the equator or toward the pole because it's the plasma and so it rotates at different rates. But yeah, days, but this rotates in 6.5 hours, which translates to a rotational speed of about 160 times per second at its equator. Uh, sorry, 160 miles per second at its equator, excuse me. The rapid rotation rate makes the star oblate spheroid. The equatorial diameter is four solar, mass, uh, solar, four solar radii, and it's 20... 2% greater than its polar diameter, which is 3.32 solar radii. Terezad is a second brightest star in Aquila. Its name is derived from the Persian, which means the beam of the scale. Its spectral class K3-2 is a bright giant with an apparent magnitude of 2.72 and is approximately 461 light years in distance. Uh, it is 2,960 times more luminous than our sun and has a radius of 110 solar radii, taking up about half an astronomical unit. In other words, it would be pretty close to us here on the Earth if we were rotating around it. It's a known source of X-rays. It's the only about 100 million years old, and yet it's already burning helium into carbon at its core. And this is KFI, JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 18, please. NGC 
NGC, that stands for New General Catalog, NGC 6760 is a globular uh, star cluster. Dave Hutchinson writes in his, uh, that this globular is a pretty easy to locate and observe. And he found numerous reports of people locating this cluster using just binoculars. Using his 13-inch Newtonian, he describes NGC 6760 as a very nice cluster and is very symmetrical with a pretty dense core. He adds that he didn't think he resolved it completely. Slide master, slide number 19, NGC 6781 is a planetary nebula known as the Snow Globe Antenna. Dave Hutchinson writes, that NGC 6781 is sort of a cross between M57, the Ring Nebula, and M97, the Owl Nebula. Like the Ring Nebula, the object is well-defined ring, but unlike the Ring Nebula and more like the Owl Nebula, this object's interior is well illuminated. He mentions that it is a nice object for an 8-inch telescope and bigger, and challenges those with very large telescopes to see if it can find the central star shining at 16th magnitude. Slide master, slide number 20, please. Just two more objects. NGC 6751 is the planetary nebula known as the Dandelion Puffball, or the Glowing Eye Nebula. Dave Hutchinson writes that NGC 6751 was difficult to see in his 13-inch telescope because it's very faint and small and it's almost lost in the crowded Milky Way star field. Yes, Milky Way goes right through the constellation of Aquila. Slide master, slide number 21. NGC 6778 is another planetary nebula known as the Sun of M76. Dave Hutchinson writes that NGC 6778 is even more difficult to find than the previously mentioned NGC 6751 with his 13-inch telescope. He suggests using medium power to find it and that you will notice it easily as an irregular yet round fuzzy star. And this is KF5 JHA and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 22 please. There are a lot more Astronomical League observing program objects than the constellation of Aquila the Eagle. I've given you just a sampling of some of those objects. The Astronomical League has at last count 77 different observing programs most of which have about 100 objects. Now, if you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn an observing certificate and a pen in about a year from the Astronomical League. And slide master, slide number 23, that is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Aquila the Eagle. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for their research and words uh, on the deep sky objects that I use, borrow and steal for every Skynet. I also, at times, use the website constellation-guide.com information. Now, next week, we'll take a look at it. Two for two constellations. Vopecula, the little fox, and Sagita, the arrow. Or Sagita. I've heard it pronounced both ways. And this is KF5JHA sending it back to our net control. 73, everyone. Have a great night and a great week. Thank you, Chas. Thank you for all of your uh, work you did this evening. This is KE5ICX. We're going to skip down to recent astronomical discoveries with Brenda, WB5OZL. So, Brenda, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and, and do your article, you, you don't have to do it all. I, we're running out of time, but whatever you'd like to read uh, from KE5ICX. Oh, my, I see it is pretty late. Okay, I'll, I'll just read part of it. Um, this is WB5OZL, and the uh, article is entitled Mysterious Neptune Dark Spot Detected from Earth for the First Time. Using ESO's very large telescope, astronomers have observed a large dark spot in Neptune's atmosphere with an unexpected smaller bright spot adjacent to it. This is the first time a dark spot on the planet is ever been observed with a telescope on the Earth. These occasional features in the blue background of Neptune's atmosphere are a mystery to astronomers, and the new results prove further clues as to their nature and origin. Large, large spots are common features in the atmospheres of giant planets, and the most famous being Jupiter's Great Red Spot. On Neptune, a dark spot was first discovered by NASA's, NASA's Voyager 2 in 1989, before disappearing a few years later. Since the first discovery of a dark spot, 
I've always wondered what these short-lived and elusive dark features are, says Patrick Irwin, professor at the University of Oxford in the UK and lead investigator of the study published today in Nature Astronomy. Irwin and his team used data from ESO's VLT to rule out the possibility that dark spots are caused by a clearing in the clouds. The new observations indicate instead that dark spots are likely the result of air particles darkening in a layer below the main visible haze layer as ices and hazes mix in Neptune's atmosphere. Coming to this conclusion was no easy feat because dark spots are not permanent features in Neptune's atmosphere and astronomers have never before been able to study them in sufficient detail. The opportunity came after the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope discovered several dark spots in Neptune's atmosphere, including one in the planet's northern hemisphere, first noticed in 2018. Irwin and his team immediately got to work studying it from the ground with an instrument that is ideally suited to these challenging but from sciencedaily.com. So, back to that, WB5OZL. Uh, thank you, Brenda. This is KE5ICX. I'll go ahead and take, um, I think what will be our final round of check-ins this evening. If you'd like to join us this evening, let us know you're out there. Please come with your call sign, send I think your name and where you're transmitting from. Kilo 5, Julia, Delta Whiskey with a question. Perfect timing, uh, John. Go ahead. K5JDW. I'm sure a lot of us remember the asteroid collision on Jupiter. Uh, it left spots in the atmosphere for a while, too, but I don't remember how long. I was wondering if somebody could comment on that. K5JDW. Does anyone remember? I think that was Shoemaker Levy, if I remember correctly. Does anybody remember how long the uh, the uh, holes remained in the atmosphere? Nobody's answering, but I was looking it up. I'm trying to see if I can find out how long it would have lasted. Uh, hold on here. Okay, this one says, says these fragments collided with Ju Jupiter's southern hemisphere between July 16th and 22nd of 1994 at a speed of approximately 37 miles per second. Jupiter's escape velocity were 134,000 miles per hour. The prominent scars from the impacts were more easily visible from the great red spot and persisted for many months. So apparently it did take a while. Um, that's about all I can tell you. Uh, I got this from the wiki on Comet Shoemaker Levy. What do you think, John? Is that good? Thank you, sir. I guess I could have looked it up, too. I figured someone had it off the top of their head. I uh, just uh, wondered if, uh, why, why, yeah, I guess I'll go look at uh, Brenda's thing and uh, compare the, all the notes and see why they came up with what they did. And uh, we, could, uh, we could actually, here on Earth, uh, we, we could monitor the uh, RF uh, from when that happened. It was pretty cool. Anyway, thank you, sir, very much. K5JDW. Yeah, thanks for the question, John. I thought for sure we'd have somebody who had all the answers to this question, but oh well. We'll just have to use the uh, artificial intelligence as better understood as the wiki, which is really not intelligent at all, but it does have a lot of good information. All right, I think we're going to call it a I'm done. I'm so, uh, the closing part of the trip movie here yet. tonight we had, how many we have? Uh, 20 check-ins, not too bad. We've done better, but I think the Cowboys interfered uh, with their game tonight, participating on the air. 
including myself. I want to thank all who checked in. Hope to join us here next week, every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration, because on this net, the sky is never the limit. We're also looking for net controls for this and all the other DARC nets. If you'd like to try your hand at this, send an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussions about this net, astronomy in general, on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie, X-Ray, Tom, and I'll be closing the net at 2230 local time. Seven, three, everybody, and enjoy discovering the universe. We will be back in about five minutes to discuss Electric Dreams from 1984, the movie about artificial intelligence. We will see you then. It will be in uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you.
WB500, I will be your Nick Troll tonight for the Afterglow movie. Uh, does anyone need to use their fear before we proceed? Tonight's movie is called Electric, Electric Dreams from 1984. And uh, there was a brief synopsis uh, earlier during the Skynet net um, that went like this. Miles Harding, a nerd of the First Order, had seen 2001 A Space Odyssey a million times, but had never registered that Hal had it in for Dave Bowman. Mount Miles, in short, was a nerd, but also an idiot. Miles bought every existence accessory he could for his new computer and his computer liked it a lot. In a matter of days, he demanded dinner out, vacation to Puerto Rico, and fancy clothing it couldn't even wear. It was when his computer wouldn't open the garage door until Miles complied with his demands that the famous SF film finally registered in his head. So... Uh, this is what Wikipedia says about the movie. Miles Harding is an architect who envisions a brick shaped like a jigsaw puzzle that could enable buildings to withstand earthquakes. Seeking a way to get organized, he buys a personal computer to help him develop his ideas. Although he is initially unsure that he will even be able to correctly operate the computer, he later buys numerous extra gadgets that were not necessary for his work, such as switches, to control household appliances like the blender, a speech synthesizer, and a microphone. The computer addresses Miles as moles because Miles had incorrectly typed his name during the initial setup. When Miles attempts to download the entire database from a mainframe computer at work, his computer begins to overheat. In a state of panic, Miles uses a nearby bottle of champagne douse the overheating machine, which then becomes sentient. I, I, who knew it would be just that simple to, uh, to uh, create your, uh, make your computer sentient? Miles initially is unaware of the computer's newfound sentience, but discovers it one night when he's awakened by the computer in the middle of the night when it mimics Miles talking in his sleep. A love triangle soon develops among Miles, his computer, who later identifies himself as Edgar, and Miles' neighbor, an attractive cellist named Madeline Robestad. Upon hearing her practicing minuet in G major, uh, BWV on 114 from Notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach on her cello, through an air vent contacting both apartments. Edgar promptly elaborates a parallel variation of the piece, leading to an improvised duet. Believing it was Miles who had engaged her in the duet, Madeline begins to fall in love with him, though she has an ongoing relationship with fellow musician Bill. At Miles' request, Edgar composes a piece of music for Madeline. When their mutual love becomes evident, however, Edgar responds with jealousy, canceling Miles' credit cards and registering him as an armed and dangerous criminal. Upon discovering this humiliation, Miles and Edgar have a confrontation where Miles shoves the computer and tries to unplug it, getting an electric shock. Then the computer retaliates by harassing him with an impro improvised maze of remotely controlled household electronics in the style of Pac-Man. Eventually, Edgar accepts Madeline and Madeline and loves, no, and Miles' love for each other and appears to commit suicide by sending a large electric current out to his acoustic coupler modem around the world and finally reaching back to himself just after he and Miles make amends. Later, as Madeline and Miles go on vacation together, Edgar's voice is heard on the radio dedicating a song, a song to The Ones I Love titled Together in Electric Dreams. The credits, credits are interspersed with scenes of the song being heard all over California, including a radio station trying to shut it off 
declaring that they do not know where the signal is coming from. Okay, let's take some check-ins and get started. Um, we'll start with regular check-ins. Uh, please come now with your uh, name, call sign, your location, and whether or not you saw the movie. Please come now. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony in Dallas. I've seen half of it. Oscar, Echo, Tommy from Bald Springs, and yes, this is one of my favorite movies. Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray, Tom still yes, I saw the film. Kilo Bravo 9, Sierra Oscar Kilo, Sean of Fort Worth, yes, I've seen this film. November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia, in Fort Worth. I've seen this movie about a hundred times. Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf Cruise in Arlington. Yes, saw the film. Ah, most of it. Did see the movie, and uh, Tony, you double with uh, um, Tommy, double with Tony, right at the end. So, I got your name, but I missed your call sign. Would you please come back with it? Yes, Tommy is Kilo India Five Zulu Oscar Echo. Okay, Kilo India Five Zulu Oscar Echo, and you, uh, Tommy, did see the movie. KE5 ICX, Tom, he, yes, he saw it. KB9 SOK, Sean, he saw it. NV5F, Virginia, yes, he saw it. And KI5 KWG, Cruz, yes, he saw it. So do we have anybody on Echo Link out there? Brenda, it's tumbleweeds out there. There's no one on Echo Link. Uh, do you know the call sign? Negative, there is no one at zero zip, none, nada, on Echolink. It's understood. I, I realize now, I thought maybe Tumbleweeds was somebody's nickname. Uh, well, okay, we may pick up some later. Any other check-ins? Well, let's get started. Uh, we'll use our usual format. We'll start with the plot and then go on to characterization and then special effects. So we'll just go down the list. Tony, in T5TM, what did you think about the plot? Well, so far, my reaction to it is uh, sort of like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mostly harmless. Uh, it's been cute and amusing. It has, of course, uh, <laughs> you know, people always, in the early days of computers, you know, you get gimmick movies. There were CB movies and hot rod movies and big rig movies. This was the season of the, uh, the century for computer movies. And certainly people, you know, imagine them being a lot more autonomous than they were at the time when it was hard to get them to do anything. So print out your term paper. Uh, but, there, you know, there were parts of the plot that were not unrealistic. Uh, his amount of swearing and all the passwords written on odd scrap to, scraps of paper seemed completely appropriate uh, for the early days of computers. Uh, likewise, you know, certainly I, I had a co-worker who was an early smart home enthusiast with special outlet adapters and, yes, uh, gizmos that had to be added to all the door locks and, and whatnot. So, 
Uh, that didn't necessarily happen right then, but that actually did happen over the, uh, the course of the years. Uh, fortunately, I've never heard of anyone getting in a love triangle with their computer, and they don't seem to be able to rep music either, but uh, there was some surprising realism and, and mildly amusing humor. So I probably will finish it. Uh, definitely not going to be my, my favorite amazing epic movie, uh, but a lot more comic relief than 2001. NT5TM. More comic relief than 2001. Oh my. I don't think there was any in that. Uh, but yeah, a lot of comic relief in this movie. So, uh, next up, uh, KF5's uh, Zulu Oscar Echo. Tommy, what did you think about the plot? Uh, thank you. Yeah, when, whenever uh, uh, the movie was being described, <laughs> whenever the movie was being described, I was like, did I watch the correct movie? But then when you went to the Wikipedia and you were talking about the architect, Miles, I was like, okay, I did watch the right movie. This is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, I really like the movie because I really like uh, Virginia Madsen. She is a heartthrob. But uh, as far as the plot, there's a lot of toxic masculinity colonizing the woman. Uh, I saw her first. She's mine. You shouldn't go after the woman that I was with first. That kind of um, thing. These these guys in these rom-cons are role models for us when we were young men, and I, I really feel like that was something that set us back, and it took us quite a few um, girlfriends to uh, work through that and become um, more better able to uh, see women as, you know, humans, as uh, spirits like us kind of thing because of these rom-cons where they're seen almost as like conquest uh, reset. Now, as far as the triangles, there were two triangles. There was the Bill and uh, Madeline and uh, Miles triangle that, from her perspective. And then from Miles' perspective, there was also that triangle, but then he realized later on there was another triangle between him and Madeline and Edgar. So, that, so there was uh, some complexity and some shifting and some... So the plot was, was kind of twisting here and there around it, which I, I thought made it a little more interesting than just a simple uh, computer fairy tale is what they said it was in the beginning. Uh, something else I thought was interesting is, is when I watched this movie, and it takes me back to the time when we were concerned with things like biorhythms. I used to have a Commodore 64, and one of the programs that I, that I got for it was to predict my biorhythms. I don't know, if people that are uh, in the uh, Gen X or Boomer age might uh, remember such things. So uh, watching this movie, the culture of it, the uh, roller skate, jazzercise stuff going on, uh, I love watching the movie because it kind of takes me back to when I was young. Uh, I guess that's really all I wanted to mention about the plot uh, for now. KI five Zoe. Okay. Um, KI five ICX Tom. And, and by the way, Tommy, uh, this is our usual format. There is a uh, a parody synopsis presented during um, uh, Skynet. Uh, it's always written by KI five ICX. Uh, and he's, of course, pretty clever. But then uh, you know, it will make you think you watched the wrong movie. But then we get the real synopsis during the afterglow net. So uh, go ahead, Tom, defend yourself. Well, thank you, Brenda. I think I watched the wrong movie because I watched the one with the uh, with the, uh, the the jealous computer. But you know, okay. Well, let's see. Uh, well, I, I can't say that I was a huge fan of this movie. I know that there are people who are big fans of movies. I also know there's people who like Windows, and there are people like myself who can't stand it. So um, if your mileage may vary. Um, I thought it was interesting. It was a little too cutesy for me 
in the sense was the voice and all that, and that was he was quite good doing that. I thought uh, overall, I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, but the, 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 I don't think the movie really knew what it wanted to be when it grew up. Was it going to be serious, as it was kind of towards the middle or the latter part of the film, and then it went happy, happy at the end because we have to have a happy ending. That's what we all decided when we were watching it last night. There's got to be a happy ending. So it's that, oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. My computers never did any of that stuff, the ones that I had back then, so I wouldn't expect a lot. Um, I, I, I also agree with Tommy's comments, too, talking about kind of the, 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 the guys and the, the attitudes and, the, and how they were acting was kind of that stupid kind of macho thing that never really made any sense, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I'm looking at it in retrospect, too. I mean, I'm trying to think, what, what was I thinking back then? And, oh, I don't know. It, it, maybe, maybe I would have liked it better if it was 1984 and I would have watched it. Oh, and by the way, just just for the fun of it, you know, there is a parody version of 2001 Space Odyssey. I think they did it on Second City TV, and they have uh, the the door routine from the uh, the Three Stooges, where the astronauts are going through the doors looking for the monolith, and the monolith actually has feet and hands and goes through the doors too. So they keep looking for the monolith uh, through the six doors that they have to go through from left to right, right to left. You know the routine. You've seen it. So they, they've done that, which is kind of fun. Uh, what else? Uh, I don't know if I've got anything really positive to say. Uh, revisiting the 80s, the big hair and all that, I suppose, was kind of interesting. I don't know if I really like the 80s all that much. Uh, kind of more of a 70s guy. Okay, back to net control. ke 5 icx Tom, next. KB9SOK, Sean, what did you think? Yeah, this is KB9SOK. Uh, well, um, I'm afraid I'm citing more on Tom's side on this one. Um, I actually kind of hated this movie. <laughs> it, it, I found it very irritating. Uh, you know, just for me, you know, it started out maybe with a little bit of promise. Um, you know, as far as, you know, when the computer began beginning to learn and uh, it was learning from the music, I thought, well, that was kind of interesting. You know, it kind of gave it a cutesy kind of almost like the computer was developing a personality, um, which was nice, you know, because, okay, this has got some potential. And then the thing went completely off the rails after that. Uh, you know, the guy, all he did was scream at it all day long, but then the computer started screaming back at him. You know, I just, after, as the movie went on, I cared for both characters less and less and less. And, you know, the key to any movie is you want to care for the characters. And, you know, I felt bad for the girlfriend, um, you know, because she was being treated poorly, I felt. Uh, you know, I agree, too, the masculinity thing was way overdone. Um, you know, and it, it, it just, I felt bad for her, but I began to really hate the guy, and I was starting to hate the computer. Uh, which is, you know, not really what you want in this kind of a movie. Uh, you know, because we've had many, many, many movies with AI, you know, and, and you usually at some point start to actually care for them uh, because they do start to develop what appears to be a personality, and you do start rooting for them. Um, and this was the one of them. You know, you can take the, you know, like the classic TV show, even like Knight Rider. You know, you, you like the car because the AI, you know, you, you, you felt like it was really alive. And obviously, we, we just watched a movie with Hal. Even Hal had better personality. And, you know, he was trying to kill people with his computer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and then you got movies like Short Circuit that we watched a while back. You know, you care about the AI, you care about the characters. And I just didn't care about these people. You know, my biggest problem with it, uh, as it went on, of course, you yeah, have the whole dumping wine on the keyboard, why that would magically do it, that was just totally stupid. Um, yeah, that made no sense at all. Uh, you know, yeah, it does bring back some memories of the of the 80s. Uh, my first computer also was a Commodore. And yes, I was that dork that hooked actual devices to it and controlled lights and stuff with my computer. <laughs> I was that guy. 
I never hooked my doors to it though. <laughs> but I did hook lights and other things to it. But uh, so that I found mildly amusing because uh, it did bring back brief memories of that. Uh, but just, just the attitude of, of these characters, I just didn't care for them. And then the, the forever monologues as it kept showing, you know, them having fun and, you know, yeah, in all your love stories you usually at least have one, but this one had multiple and it just got boring. And I was so, so tempted to put this on two times speed. Um, I kept having to fight the, the urge to do so because <laughs> it was just, you know, just drug it on and on and on. Um, and then, yeah, the whole ending thing was crazy, too. That, you, you know, why, why would a phone call from the other side of the world cause a surge? Makes no sense. Um, and then even in the end, when they finally come to grips with each other, you know, then the computer attempts to commit suicide and, you know, that, but yet it's still magically alive somehow at the end. Um, I just wasn't crazy about the ending. I mean, I like happy endings, but I would have liked it if they handled that differently. But, yeah, unfortunately, this definitely was one that I particularly cared for, which kind of explains why I probably didn't see this in the 80s. Um, it's definitely anything sci-fi from, you know, pretty much 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s. I pretty well thought I'd watch them all, but this one I don't remember ever seeing it. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm glad the few people who got some enjoyment out of it. But, uh, yeah, no, this one's definitely not for me. So, yeah, back to that, KB9, that's okay. Thank you, Sean. Next up, Virginia, November Victor 5, Foxtrot. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, you bunch of fuddy duddies. I got a few things to say. Um, and I'm glad to, to, I think Cruz and Brenda both liked this movie, so maybe going forward things will get a little more fun around here. Uh, first off, I think 2001 is hilarious. Um, it's a very subtle kind of hilarious. I really think it's funny. Sometimes I watch it and just enjoy the irony of the fact that I'm fascinated by watching a movie where all you hear is a guy breathing for 15 minutes. It's great. I love it. I think it's, I think it's really funny. There's a lot of jokes in 2001. BBC 12, uh, those grip shoes. Um, Dr. Floyd sleep while he's, you know, in outer space. I mean, there's a bunch of great jokes in it. It's really just really subtle. Um, so anyway, off my soapbox about 2001 being funny. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm with Tony. I remember the, I remember the smart home stuff. And I, I think this movie actually has some really really timely things in it that are um that were very forward looking at the time and and uh things that only nerds did um and i i did think that was funny i remember buying my first ibm clone computer from radio shack it was in, and i think it had a smart home option and it was a really big deal and i'm sure it was really expensive uh, all i wanted was a modem uh, anyway, I've loved this movie since I saw it when I was a kid, and um, I think the plot is simple, it's silly, it's supposed to be silly, it's called a fairy tale for computers, um, it's kind of high concept, um, you know, what if a computer were alive, we had a lot of that, like, like Sean was talking about, we recently watched Short Circuit. Uh, I was already a Short Circuit slash 2001 fan before I saw Electric Dreams, and it just appealed to me. I, I think that the plot is simple, it's straightforward. I think everybody, and including Wikipedia, made way more out of uh, the Bill character uh, than should be made. He was just a typical, you know, good-looking dude who was a good musician who saw a pretty girl and probably was used to being able to get pretty girls and Madeline didn't really have a relationship with him she just saw him at rehearsal every day and and um he brought her flowers and you know uh territorially kissed her at one point okay here's where I'm gonna get back on my soapbox I am a girl and I have seen this movie a bunch of times and the quote-unquote masculinity in it is pretty normal and not offensive at all. And I hate all the toxic masculinity revisionists 
stuff we're doing right now. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to I'm not going to arm wrestle anybody over it. But I don't like any of that modern stuff where we go back and look at everything and criticize it um, and and turn it into something it wasn't. It's just a typical story about a nerdy guy who's trying to get a pretty girl who you know finds out that he has some some uh, you know he falls into a situation where she's impressed with him and he he rolls with it because she's she's nice and pretty and she's his neighbor and um, I think it's a kind of a cute little triangle where you know the computer comes to life because of several things it gets the box gets dropped champagne gets spilled on it uh, it's just silly it's supposed to be like kind of like short circuit you know it's like what if some a few silly things happened you know and and something just a confluence of things and a computer comes to life you know like lightning striking a robot can make it come to life you know it's just it's just silly and fun and i do think that as the plot developed and got into the kind of angry part where, you know, the, the confrontation that always has to happen, you know, that's movies need to have that. Um, and I thought it got a little bit off point there with with uh, it getting a little too angry and Miles being a mild-mannered sort of nerdy guy, I think he got a little too screamy and, um, and angsty. Uh, and that part of the movie was fortunately short-lived. And I think it got to the point pretty quickly about you know, he finally realizes he can't lie anymore, and it's it's just digging him in deeper and deeper, and and he actually realizes that he loves Madeline, you know, because he just does, and she realizes she just loves him because he's him, and the music doesn't matter, and um, then she gets to have her uh, moment of discovering that the computer is the one who wrote the music, and. Um, I'm sure Miles explains the whole thing at some point, um, you know, and I thought the, I, I kind of liked the transcendental sort of things like in Short Circuit where, you know, a lightning can make a robot alive and, um, and you have this kind of, well, how, how can Edgar like, you know, bow out and Miles can get back to his normal life and you know, the crazy thing with the power surge and now Edgar's sort of in the in the wires all over the world. I kind of like that. I thought, well, he's just everywhere. You know, now he's sort of gone on to the next plane and he can just take over radios and play songs all over the, all over the world or all over the state or wherever. And I thought it was a cute idea. It was fun. And, and it had that bittersweet ending where he left, but he was still there. And they knew he was, they always knew he was around and sort of maybe even looking out for him or something and they had that good memory of him bringing them together and uh, I love the feel good you know I like the feel good 80s fish out of water um, robots and computers coming to life it was a common plot back then especially with all the technology boom from the from the early 80s to the you know from 1980 to that point computers were a big topic and so I loved this movie when I was a kid I still love it I see its shortcomings um, I, it's a simple story. Uh, it's cute. It's fun. It's funny. It's got a little bit of angst in it that I could probably do without. But overall, um, I thought it was. I I still love it. It's it's one of my one of my comfortable movies, and I can totally see why Tom doesn't like it because he he does not do cute. So it is kind of cute, and I still think it's cute. And uh, anyway, off my soapbox and back to knit in V5F. Okay, uh, Cruz, KI5KWG, your turn. KI5KWG, yes, I have notes and I'm laughing at them. <laughs> open the pod bay door, Hal, becoming, open the front door, Edgar. <laughs> and that was inspired by Tom's synopsis. I've laughed every time I've heard it. I've heard it three times. Well, I read it once and heard it twice today. I love that line, and I did not make that connection, but I know the screenwriters um, made that connection with the front door 
with the computer locking him out of his own apartment during that scene. And, and uh, it, it, it's obviously what he was referring to, and I thought it was very funny and impressed that uh, you all got it because I completely missed it. The flip side of that, um, well, I guess kind of the way this, uh, this particular uh, flow is going, um, I'm going to give a little backstory. I graduated from college in 83. I was, of course, very, very busy. Um, and uh, I immediately went to work for a computer software company. I was into computers already. I know what the Edgar reference is. Uh, well, I'll back up for that. I, I uh, Part of my uh, college, I was also working a graveyard shift as a computer operator for IBM out of Irving. And uh, I used Edgar, which is the text editor, and uh, uh, for the IBM mainframes back in those days. So uh, I was kind of savvy with computers, and and uh, I recognized uh, the computer terminal and and the Edgar reference. Um, so, uh, but because I had been so busy, both working and going to school um, full time, uh, I was out of one of my favorite things in life, and that was, um, well, two favorite things in life, that was, that was films and dating. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I had a girlfriend, she had lived across the hall from me while I was in college, and I started working, and she was teasing me about not having seen things like E.T., I'd never seen the movie E.T. and the whole world had been talking about it. But I'd just been too busy to watch and go to films. And I think it may have been the first film I saw in a theater was with that, that, uh, that girl, Amy. And uh, she wanted to go see Electric Dreams. So I have a very romantic association um, with this film. And even though... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not behaving tonight. Even though it did not have science fiction uh, standard of a girl in a animal skin bikini. So, um, but what this, what this film, no one mentioned it. And I went to IMDb last night to look at it. Um, and no one catches it there, and it's not in the Wikipedia article. I'm going to reset again, and I'm not going to be too much longer. This is a, a, a spin, a take, on the Cyrano de Bergerac story. And if you're not familiar with it, I'll suggest you go watch the film, a uh, great Steve Martin film, um, called Roxanne, which is also pretty much a straight take on the Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac. Cyrano had this huge, grotesquely huge nose, and he teased about it all the time, all his life. He knew about it. It made him shy. It made him inward. He knew his heart's desires, as far as romance goes, was never going to happen. And he is desperately meets this girl and he just thinks she is wonderful. She's the shallow one. She's the shallow one. And in this, Edgar is that person. And in a way, um, and partially Cyrano de Bergerac, but she's the shallow one because she's not interested in Cyrano. Um, but she's fallen in love with his writing, not knowing who actually is writing it. And uh, so it's a little bit reversed. Edgar's writing the music. She thinks the guy is. So she's falling in love with the guy who's not behind what she fell in love with. Break again. And in the Cyrano de Bergerac story, which I think was originally a play, um, he's the writer, the big nose guy, is the writer in love with a, with a big, strong man and, and uh, um, fighter and warrior type, and, uh, but who's kind of an idiot and a fool. And so Cyrano 
out of his love for the girl, his secret, unrequited love for the girl, writes letters on behalf of the other guy so that she falls in love with the other guy, his real rival. Anyway, if you, if you come into the film knowing that going on, I think the, uh, the attitude towards the uh, masculinity changes a whole lot because it was self-sacrificial in the original story. And we see that to some degree in this one with the computer getting suicidal, I guess, um, because of his eventually giving up his love, sacrificing it for another. But... Uh, it's a very interesting plot, and I kind of came at it that way, and as I said, with a tinge of romance in my own mind when I sat down to see it in the theater. And uh, I, I liked what they did with it. So I've got something else, but I'm going to save that for the next part. And uh, so I'm going to go back to that with, I think, my longest ever take on a movie's plot. KI5, KWG, back to you, Brenda. Okay, Cruz, um, and before I make my comments, do we have any more check-ins? Okay, this is WB5OZO. I had never seen this movie. I hadn't even heard of it, which I don't understand because, uh, I, I mean, I used to go to lots and lots of movies, but um, in 1984, my kids were three and seven years old, and uh, we probably wouldn't have, this movie wouldn't appeal to them so much, so we would be going and seeing other sci-fi movies. Um, I do have one question. How do these people afford an apartment in San Francisco? Um, you, those are nice, large apartments that you would probably have to uh, be wealthy uh, and not be just a cellist. Um, they make okay money, but not not enough to afford an apartment in San Francisco. Anyway, that's just an aside. I did enjoy this movie very much. I think I'd like to see it again. Um, not generally too up on rom-coms. Uh, it's not my favorite thing, but... Uh, they're okay sometimes. If, you know, it's, just, it's a situation comedy, which means you have to have a situation, which means somebody's got to have a misunderstanding or a deception or a confusion somehow, which makes you want to yell at them going, don't do that, that's stupid. Or, you know, tell the truth. It is. And, and I get kind of frustrated at these um, scenarios sometimes. And... It was, it was a little bit the way I felt here. It's like, you know, tell her or come clean or whatever. But uh, that's the stuff that rom-coms are made of and situation comedy, so you're going to have that. Uh, and I wasn't too put off with the masculinity thing. That's, I mean, this is just standard movie fare for as long as I can remember, and I don't think that's going to change. I was quite fascinated by all the computer stuff. It's like, you know, a little walk back in time. Uh, I remember uh, everything. Uh, I had two questions. In 1984, if we brought a new computer into our house, you didn't just plug it in and use it. There were many steps to take, installing programs and we're dealing with your operating system and uh, nothing ever worked right. Uh, the children learned lots of new words from their dad as he tried to make this stuff work right. And he was an electrical engineer, so, you know, he, he, he you know, should have been easy for him, but it never was. Computers are so easy these days. I just recently uh, turned on a new computer and it worked right off. No installations, no problems. Uh, no grief, but boy, in 1984 there was. You, uh, all those of you who remember it, it was no small thing. You better set aside the weekend to try and get the thing going. And maybe even a call to the help desk in the process. So that he could just come home and turn it on and, and operate all. Okay, it's, it's a movie. So, uh... 
Uh, I guess I should stop there. Um, uh, we'll move on. Um, next topic will be the characterizations. NT5TM. Tony, you're up. Well, thank you, Brenda, and, and thanks to everyone who thinks more deeply about the movies than I do. I often have a very like that I didn't like a kind of simple reaction to them. I do have to point out, because Aaron is sitting here with me and can hear the net, that the cellists are always the most attractive people in the orchestra. And, as she adds, they have the best instruments. I actually do really rather like the cello. And again, kind of like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I have to stick so far with Mostly Harmless for the characters. They didn't seem terrifically interesting to me, but, you know, this is a pretty light comedy. I wasn't expecting somebody with a lot of complexity. Uh, reacting to Cruz's comment, I saw that Steve Martin uh, Roxanne movie years and years ago, I, and I do remember it being a, a Cyrano de Bergerac story. Uh, I will have to watch that again. I think he's a firefighter, and he uses his big nose at one point to find a fire that they can uh, put it out. And that, I remember that being kind of funny and neat. Uh, so, yeah, mostly harmless. Always good to see a cellist as the hero. NT5TF. Tommy, K-I-5-Z-O-E, what do you think about the characters? All right, so uh, the, the first one I want to mention is Edgar, the, the uh, AI uh, personality of the computer. Uh, he seemed to me, I, I got the impression he was, he was uh, just a, he was like a, just a baby. He was just immature, but also naive, but very intelligent, very sharp. He would pick up things very quickly. Um, and very honest, and that was a big contrast between him and Miles, because Miles, he was just a liar, and, and it seemed like he didn't want, he didn't try to be a liar, it's like, I think it was his um, insecurity about himself that made him put on a mask and hide who he was, even though uh, he was actually a pretty cool guy, reset. So, like, for instance, in the towel scene where he's trying to hide the computer from Madeline and um, you look at his body and, oh, my gosh, I need to tone my body so bad because he looked great. Um, the other thing is uh, he was very sharp. He was an architect. He was working on a brick that was going to um, save lives from earthquakes. Um, and the other thing is, uh, as we found out, he was a very talented sketch artist in the uh, sketch that he did of Madeline. That was fantastic sketch art. So he was just a very talented, very, um, very interesting guy who was actually good looking, but he did not know it. And then there was Madeline, and, and to me, Madeline, uh, oh my gosh, it's hard for me to, uh, to describe her because I know that I've got rose-colored glasses <laughs> because I'm in love with that actress and that character, and every time she would just, the looks on her face, the way she talked, everything about her just gets my heart moving. Um, but but um, to be more critical, I did notice that she did interrupt Miles when he made an attempt to be honest with her. She did interrupt him because she was uh, very much um, holding on to what she thought was true. And so it was kind of, so it didn't make it any easier for him to take off the mask and show his true colors. Um, and then as far as Bill, he was just, he was a, a major character, but one thing that did show, display something about him was that he was not a important character, was when she um, had a, a very sad 
unfortunate accident where her cello was broken and she went and and went to Bill and he was um, really talking about okay who's going to be in our in our um, on, in our little group because we need to find a replacement and he was being fairly insensitive because we find out that her that when she came to him thinking he might be emotionally receptive he didn't really see her as anything to be re emotionally receptive to, about she was just a player in a group and uh, a cog in a wheel in the machine sort of thing and and that really kind of pushed her to to even though she told Miles <laughs> that he was the one that she would that she uh, went to later on, um, she actually went to Bill first. <laughs> um, uh, she didn't mention that, so you know what? Maybe my rose-colored glasses are a little too rosy. I don't know, but oh my gosh, I love that woman. Anyway, that's the characters I want to talk about. Ki five Z O E. Okay, Tom, KE5ICX, you're next. Oh, man, how do I follow all these people after all these, all the character analysis and everything? It's like, okay, that's great. I, I was busy looking at the annoying computer, talking annoyingly, as but for the annoying voice of that your I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I agree with the comments uh, about uh, Miles and, and the fact that you know he's he's a nerd, but at the same time he was uh, perfectly fine, and uh, I can see why Madeline would like him, sort of, kind of, and all that. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of is standard character types to me, so I didn't put a lot of stock into any of them, to be honest with you. In some ways, I was hoping maybe Edgar could, like, completely wipe them all out. That would have been kind of cool in the house. they find him the next morning. They're all petrified or something because Edgar wouldn't let them out of the house. And they find the bodies, like, I don't know, months later, you know. And, and the computer's still sitting there with his little bouncing uh, cursor, uh, just blinking cursor. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. And did you know that Giorgio Moroder was the record producer? Yeah, he's the guy who did the music. He also did a lot of songs for, uh, what was it? I'm trying to remember. The uh, disco person. Did a bunch of things uh, for them. So, for Casablanca Records, but I can't remember. I'm getting tired. I'm so tired. I'm so very, very tired. Okay, that's it. I, I don't have anything else. You got, I got nothing. Uh, back net control, KE5ICX. Okay, KB9, SCX, you're next. Hi, Tom. Sean, what do you think about the characters? Yeah, this is KB9, SOK. Well, once again, kind of going back to uh, what I said before, it's just, uh, yeah, the characters, I just didn't have feelings for them. Uh, they were just kind of dull, boring. Um, you know, I just, it, unlike the movie, you know, which was brought up earlier, Short Circuit, I really enjoyed that movie, but I actually felt for the characters in that movie. Um, and this one I just didn't. Um, you know, I just, there weren't really anything special there. And, uh, you know, at first I thought the movie did have promise. I, I started out with a positive feeling of the movie, and it just kind of went downhill. Um, you know, they're just all your typical stereotropes. And, you know, just because you're an engineer or a computer person doesn't mean that they're all act like that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but yeah, we see that in every single single movie, uh, and it still hasn't changed. Now, obviously, there are a few that are, but, you know, hey. So, yeah, no, I'll keep this pretty short. I, I think the actors did what they could with the script. Uh, I don't really have anything against the people who played the parts. Um, I think they did the best they could, uh, but... Over that, I'll send it back to Nat. KB9, that's okay. Okay, November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia. Go ahead. Okay, I've heard some good stuff so far. Um, Tommy's very thoughtful uh, comments uh, were, were good. Um, Tom, I'm so sorry that you that you really, I mean, I thought you might 
think it was a little goofy, but I'm, I'm sorry you you think so little of anything in this movie. Um, I thought Miles was lovable. He was uh, he was a dedicated he was dedicated to his profession. He they showed him right away, you know, on the way home from doing research on a a, a, a brick that was you know a, could have you know could be a great life saving invention. So it sort of showed his heart up front that he was a a guy with some heart. He's a little goofy. He's not a he's not a computer nerd. He's just sort of a nerdy guy. He wears glasses and and is kind of introverted and and um, you know probably doesn't do a lot of dating and um, and you know he decides to to uh, try out this whole this whole computer thing. Uh, some friend at work tells him and he, he just goes, hey, why not? And um, and you know, kind of crazy things happen, and he gets swept up in um, Madeline falling for the the music side. And uh, I have to agree that he, it's not not necessarily his fault. She was very she was Madeline was very self confident, quirky, but she you know pretty, and she knew it. Cellists are always pretty. I think the same year. Uh, Ghostbusters came out, and of course, Sigourney Weaver's character was a cellist. Um, I think that was kind of a common thing back then. You know, ooh, there's got to be a pretty, pretty lady who plays in a symphony. Let's make her a cellist. Um, I had a roommate in college who was a cellist. Um, anyway, amazing instrument. Um, so yeah, she was kind of quirky but self-confident, and I think she, she got swept up in her own fantasy. And she might not have given Miles a second glance, you know, if she didn't think he was a musician. So it kind of sucked her in enough for her to find out that she really did love him. Um, and Edgar, you know, that was a common thing back then, too. Let's try to make a robot or a computer lovable. Um, unless you're Tom and you just think they should all be like Hal and just kill everybody or whatever. <laughs> And in fact, in 2010, which came out the same year, they kind of redeemed Hal and did make him kind of lovable. I think by the end of 2010, I was pretty quick captivated by the whole situation with Hal. So it was a very, it was a very big, you know, topical thing at that point. What about smart computers? Are computers going to ever have personalities and run our houses? And are we going to be friends with them? And um, you know, now that we got stuff that's approaching the very fringes of AI, it's, it's kind of a different story about how we feel about it when it's not so far off. It's not really a fantasy, but um, Edgar was the common, innocent, fish out of water, good, good nature, good hearted, you know, naive, trying to help, trying to learn things, curious about everything, um, you know, the whole typical sitting and watching hours of TV, you know, he had a lot of that with short circuit. Um, and um, kind of going off of pop culture references. Um, you know, uh, he he was pretty he was pretty typical. I thought Bud Court did a good job with his with his voiceover and um, and uh, you know, cute but not too cute. Um, he could be you know he could be a little bit he could a little be a little bit angry and a little bit you know a little bit. Uh, get a little angst in there. He was good at the kind of screamy voice when he was frustrated or whatever. I thought uh, Lenny Von Dolan, who played Miles, did a good job um, being a good-looking guy who was playing a nerd that was also common in the 80s. Um, and Virginia Madsen is, of course, beautiful, and she's a pretty good actress, and um, this is probably one of the first things on her resume and probably one of the things she leaves off. But, um, you know, I thought it was a sweet little story about the cello getting broken and that that really is a moment where you you know you realize how miles is because he is the one who's who's there to tell her that it's her who's special not not her instrument or her music and at the end she tells him the same thing you're special it's not the music it's that i've discovered you're special and, um, you know, Edgar the computer was just the catalyst in that. And I think it's cool that they figured out 
a way for him to stick around, um, and he was selfless, um, which is another mark of the naive, uh, naive character. Often is very sacrificial, and um, so some common things here. But I thought they did some unusual stuff with it, and I liked it back then, and I still like it. It's cute, and and I think the actors did good job, a good job, and I think the characters are are uh, you know are still are still pretty interesting to me. And um, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, back to Net, NV5S. Okay, uh, KF5KBR, this is Cruz. Go ahead. KF5KWG. Yeah, I was interested in, in uh, looking up these uh, actors, and, and well, primarily the two, um, Lenny Van Dolan and, and uh, Virginia Madsen. She looked familiar to me, and somewhere in reading it said that she was just like one of the most popular actresses in the in the eighties. I think it said the mid nineteen eighties. So I looked at her her uh, filmography, and and uh, along with the TV uh, appearances, she was very prolific. I didn't remember her in anything else that was listed. And when I went and looked at Lenny Von Dolan. Um, miles or moles um, I, it was the same way just I didn't remember him or wasn't even familiar with uh, most of the works and it, it was the same with both of them I thought that was uh, curious maybe just that uh, block of time in my life when I was too busy but I don't remember seeing them in anything else although she did remind me it uh, seemed familiar um, in the discussion uh, Friday um, with some of y'all were commenting on uh, Bud Court being the voice of Edgar. And um, I couldn't place Bud Court either. And, and once again, a trip to their filmography me just didn't ring any bells for me. So, um, But the deal is, is all three of those really did a very, very fine job. And a lot of times I'll make excuses for uh, actors uh, because of poor script writing. But I thought the screenplay was pretty decent. I thought the dialogue was well done. And I thought the actors really, really did a lot with, uh, um, with their characters. So overall, I thought that part was, uh, was very well done. And I have a new note here, and it says, Aaron is right. Cellist and, I will add, flautist, they rock. KI5, KWG, back to net. Okay, anybody else want to check in, put in their two cents worth? Okay, this is WB5OZL. Um, I had never heard of these people, and I did the same thing. I looked up um, both of their filmographies, and um, most of the movies are not anything I'd ever heard of, but I, I, this happens to me all the time. You know, I'll see an, act, an actor will catch my eye, and I'll go look him up, and I've never heard of anything he's in, but he works all the time. And, and that was the way it was with these two. Both very attractive, but very wholesome and likable people. Um, you know, he was a little geeky, and... Um, you know, they weren't perfect, but they're the kind of people that you would like to have in your circle. It, you know, they're solid. And the thing with the cello, so many sitcom or rom-coms have some kind of a pivotal point where something happens and suddenly you find out the metal of that person and you realize that this is someone who's going to be there for you and it's going to... Uh, help you through some problems, and um, you know it's it's kind of the deal maker with romance. Is uh, now you know why you really want them around. Uh, Bill was just you know gone and useless, but uh, Miles was uh, was a stand up guy.
So I like the music a lot, and um, I, I, uh, the Bud Court was, he was hilarious as the computer. Uh, I thought he was just perfect, and it's, it, it's interesting how they developed the character. What if uh, Edgar didn't want to give up the girl, was willing to fight for her? You know, it would have been a different story. It would be interesting, but it would be a different story. But as it was, he did the, the, the right thing, or it was, the, you know, the gentlemanly thing to step aside and uh, how painful that might be. And otherwise, there wouldn't be much of a happy resolution. It'd be too, the conflict wouldn't be resolved. But then you feel sorry for him because he gave up his dream for someone else. So, uh, very bittersweet. And um, we may see a lot more movies about sentient computers as we move into the whole AI. Um, it's, I mean, it's in the news a lot lately as we get more and more into real AI. I think that those themes may come up more. All right. Um, next segment, you can talk about special effects, which there weren't really too many, or anything else you want to talk about. So we're uh, not really running long yet, but the evening is young. So NT5TM, Tony, go ahead, your comments. Well, thank you. I think there might be a little bit more uh, special effects later in the movie. And uh, in the half of it that I've seen, uh, they seem modest and appropriate. They, they, did, they did not overdo the computer graphics. They did, you know, make them look nicer than computers in the 80s. But they also did kind of keep them in line with the sort of blocky stuff that people actually saw. Uh, so I actually felt that was very reasonable. I enjoyed some of the little sparks and things. Uh, it made me think of today's lecture and lab because we're building batteries and you don't keep lithium cells completely discharged. You keep them at a moderate state of charge, so you have to solder them and work on them when they're live. So we, we did make some sparks today and, <laughs> you know, no big explosions, fortunately. Uh, but, but that was a, a happy memory of lecture and lab. Uh, Aaron Banks, both Virginia and Cruz, and also wants to mention that, hey, uh, one of the witches in the Witches of Eastwick uh, was a cellist, and I would like to add that the heroine in the Bond movie, The Living Daylights, uh, was a cellist as well, although, my gosh, the horror that cello went through being used as a rudder for an improvised uh, sled. <laughs> Poor cello. Uh, so, yes, I felt the effects were modest and appropriate, at least in the part of the movie that I have seen. Of course, they may go crazy in the second half, but in the beginning, they're okay. NT5TM. And don't forget the cellist and Wednesday, which I thought really enhanced that uh, TV series. Okay, uh, KF5, the ZOE. Tommy, go ahead. All right. First, I wanted to. Uh, I was. I went. To, I, I'm. I'm very appreciative of people looking at the uh, other stuff done by the actors and actresses. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that I don't. I'm kind of new to this net. Have you guys covered the 1984 Dune? Because in the very beginning of Dune, 1984 version of the movie, uh, Princess Aurelian or Princess Aurelian, uh, the big female face that. The, the girl, you're like, who's that girl? She was absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. Uh, reset. And she's talking about spice and space travel, and she's kind of setting up what spice is. That's the same actress as uh, Virginia Madsen in, in uh, the movie Electric Dreams. Just wanted to mention that. Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, as far as the music, it took me back because this was a point in time. Uh, Alcatraz montage that they were using, uh, I, I believe it was the Roland D, uh, TR-707 drum machine, which was 
very cheesy sounding, and then Roland came out with the 808, which was very cool sounding, and then all of techno went to the 808. But before the 808 came out, uh, all we had was this, the TR-707, and so you can hear that definitive sound that was from that specific time in, in, in our history. And then later on, it sounded like Boy George. I didn't, I didn't really look at who did the music, but it sounded like Boy George. But the, but the uh, e-piano sound sounded like the DX7, the Roland DX7. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Yamaha. <laughs> Yamaha DX7, which, which came out around that time, and that was a definitive uh, FM synthesis. Uh, so you guys understand what FM is through ham radio. FM is also uh, something that was new to uh, synthesis, sound synthesis back in that in that day. Reset. Okay, and then another thing I wanted to mention is during the uh, montage dream sequence, where um, where um, Miles. Uh, um, Edgar is asking what is a dream and Miles goes back to Disney and says it's a, it's a wish your heart makes when you're, when you're fast asleep and then they go into this montage and uh, we see something that we, that we didn't really see much before uh, back in those days if you saw 3D graphics it was vector graphics and if you saw like 2D video game kind of graphics that was raster graphics and what we saw in this movie was 3D rasterized graphics with the whole uh, earthquake scene and, and everything. And back in those days, I was so hungry for three-dimensional graphics that I was just absolutely um, entranced with the... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm actually tearing up. With that rasterized 3D scene, <laughs> KF5 viewing. Interesting. Are, are you a musician? Yes, I am, actually, Kev. I'm doing. Okay, so you are a musician. Uh, well, cool. I, it's very interesting to get the um, perspective on the music in um, movies. Uh, a lot of people just kind of ignore it. It's just background, but... Um, it's a, it's a big part of the history of that movie, too. Okay, KE5 ICX, Tom, um, you're up next. Oh, I heard my name. Let's see. Uh, are, are we on characterization? I think. Oh, no, we did that. We're doing special effects, I guess. Nothing to report. Uh, computers and that. Uh, eh, Mine kind of looked like that. Mine was black and white screen. So, nothing there. Uh, guys, I'm falling asleep. In fact, I just woke up. So, uh, continue on. I, I'm sure somebody has something really good to say. KE5 ICX. Okay, KE5 ICX, you're dozing off. Uh, we could watch you on the stream, but, you know, uh, I was dozing off today, but I didn't get up and run 10 miles this morning like you did. So you have every right to be tired. All right, uh, let's see, who is next? Um, uh, KB9, it's okay. Sean, go ahead. Yeah, this is KB9, it's okay. Uh, not a lot to say. Yeah, the music built the time. Um, I'm not an expert in music, so I'll leave that to the experts. Um, and, you know, the, 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 I think the, the computer started off with realistic graphics. I thought it took it maybe a little too far as they went into it. Uh, a little unrealistic for the times, but it's still okay. Uh, and, yes, the AI, AI is going to become a hotter topic, and it already is. Uh, I'm sure one day it, it's probably going to be uh, controlled just about everything, <laughs> if you're not smart. Um, not all I'll say, I, even though I didn't particularly enjoy this particular film, I did very much enjoy everybody's comments on this net, as always. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Back to that. KB9, that's okay. Okay, November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia. Go ahead. 
Okay, wow. Well, there's been some good stuff this round. I've got a lot to say because uh, I just know this movie so well. Um, I want to start with, I don't consider this a rom-com at all. It's got a romance, it has comedy, but uh, it's not a typical, it doesn't follow the, the paradigm, which is usually that the two parties involved um, don't like each other when they first meet each other. They can't stand each other, and then by the end they're in love. Um, this is not really that that kind of a, a romance romance slash comedy so i would think of it more as a rom slash com i guess um and ai movies from the 80s are i think some of them were very fun like short circuit and and then there were some scary ones like war games um you know and and i don't know that we'll have any more fun ones going forward it seems like now it's 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 hard to think of it as something that fantastic or far off uh, now it's kind of it's kind of worrisome, um, especially what people are doing with the most rudimentary AI that's out now. But I won't go on about that. Um, I appreciate uh, Tommy's comments about music. I am a musician and uh, have a degree in music and teach music for a living. Um, and the music in this movie is one of the things that drew me into it. Um, it was so exhilarating and captivating that just the little uh, little duet uh, really caught my attention uh, you know it opens with some cool music uh, the Electric Dreams theme song I think P.P. Arnold uh, did that and then um, and then I loved the Together in Electric Dreams that was at the end uh, but I remember this movie and that it got really big on cable a couple years after it came out and the soundtrack to it was very popular. And I knew people who were not into these kind of movies. They weren't into, you know, I mean, it was kind of a broad appeal sort of movie. So, you know, I'd have friends that would have the cassette of this. You know, they played in their car. And, and uh, it was just kind of one of those ubiquitous things, you know, the soundtrack to Electric Dreams. And I had the vinyl of it. I found it at the record store the weekend after I saw it and wore, it, wore the thing out. Um, it was, it did have two original songs by Culture Club uh, that were nowhere else to be found except in this movie. And the song with the drum, the rolling drum machine, that was Jeff Lynne. And if, if Jeff Lynne was producing it, he wrote, produced, and sang that song. And if he was doing it, he did it completely on purpose. He, he was very, he still is, and he's, he's, he's been a lifelong, you know, music producer, and he's one of the the most underrated and best kept secrets in music producing he's done he's brilliant he's the elo is my favorite band in the whole world so you know i i can't probably say anything bad about jeff lynn uh he's a genius finesse all over the place brilliant great singer great writer uh and then he wrote another song that was later in the movie when edgar was having the fake party when he was jealous when when Miles went out on a date with Madeline and Edgar, Edgar had his own little party. That was also a Jeff Lynne song. Um, anyway, this soundtrack, and the whole thing was real high concept. The director of it was Steve Barron, who was a music video director at the time, and that, that was the whole idea was let's get computers and all these great musicians and let's do basically a string of music videos, you know, put together by a framing device of a story and, um, you know, there's every little song, every song in the movie is a little miniature music video. So, uh, and they play almost the whole song every time. So uh, it was very based on the, the prolific interest in music videos. At the time, MTV had only been around for about three years and everybody was, you know, nuts about music videos. So um, that, was, that was definitely driving force. Uh, in this in this thing the graphics i thought as as was mentioned tony mentioned were were appropriate and in almost every movie you see with computers the graphics are a little past where where it really is at the time just to make it interesting for the audience um there were some cool rudimentary 3d things um the idea of graphic uh graphics in vector versus raster 
anything that you're going to watch on a screen, if it's even if it's originated as vector, has to be converted to raster. Um, so I used to work, I worked in video games briefly, and I remember rasterizing um, high high resolution 3D images, and that is work. You have to sit and crank it out one pixel at a time, clean it up, clean up all the edges, get all the aliasing just right, it's crazy. Um, but the graphics in this, Uh, the graphics in this, in the in the music video dream sequence, and in the kind of uh, there's I don't want to spoil anything for Tony, but there is a little arcade uh, arcade sequence uh, later in the movie that you know kind of likens Edgar and Miles' confrontation to uh, to a popular video game, which they did a 3D 3D sequence for, and very cool at the time. Um, and so I think they were going for something really, really unique and hoping it would catch on and it didn't really catch on as a movie, it caught on more as a soundtrack and uh, that soundtrack is still quite beloved uh, by, by quite a few people including me, so uh, it's, it's a great soundtrack and even some of the music, the incidental music in it's pretty good, it's all based on the themes and I thought it had a pretty tight, tight soundtrack and uh, just enough graphics, just enough effects uh, music videos, um, totally crazy, fun, funny, flighty, silly, uh, feel-good 80s movie. Uh, that's it for me, MV5F. Okay, uh, um, Cruz, KI5KWG, go ahead. KI5KWG. Yeah, I, I, uh, my, my comments on this section are about the music as well. Um, I was chatting earlier with them um, about how I think probably um, the first time I ran across Minuet in G was um, when I was five and it was on the radio in the form of uh, the toys um, uh, singing, uh, what's it called, Lover's Concerto. And uh, it was a very, very popular song back in the mid-60s. And um, um, of course, I didn't know as a five-year-old that it was it was uh, Minuet in G, which I only found out last night was not Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I was joking, but I'm in an existential crisis after finding that out. Um, but uh, that was the the song that really struck me in this film. I loved it sitting in the theater, and I think I heard it in discos in that time frame and it was titled the duel i found out on the internet um, but it's a duet that we heard with the computer and the, and um, the um matt madison was that her character's name virginia madison anyway um uh, the cellist and uh, that's one of my all-time um most memorable cello um pop songs um, right up there with my uh, one of my all-time favorites, which is kind of obscure, but I'll tell you anyway. Look it up. It's uh, Tortured Holiday by a group out of Chicago, now defunct, called The Blacks. And I absolutely love that song and uh, love the cello at the uh, end of the song. It's uh, in, in sort of a bridge, and it's, it's beautiful to me. But uh, it is the music, I think, that... Uh, really stood out in this film for me. I mean, I liked the story. I thought it was a great twist on the Cyrano de Bergerac. Oh, that reminds me. Let me reset. I'm famous, sort of. Yeah, last night I, I was looking for, for information on, on the Cyrano de Bergerac connection to this film and couldn't find anything. And so I said, well, they need it. And I went on to IMDb and I suggested a trivia edition, and they approved it today. So it's there. Go, go say, yes, this is helpful, so you'll vote, uh, vote me on it. But this is what I wrote. When Miles and Madeline are at the carnival, and he gets her, and he tells her no girl had ever won a penguin for him, it, this is about 48 minutes in, 
he responds that no boy has ever written a song for her. And Miles looks troubled after being falsely praised for work he did not do. Just then, the camera zooms in on a tray full of Pinocchio toys, each with very long noses. The symbolism is twofold. By keeping quiet, he's living a lie, thus the Pinocchio reference. Moreover, the big nose also relates to Cyrano de Bergiac, the play which is being retold with a twist of its own in this film. And my comment to the editors was, this is a clever hidden meaning in a visual. And I really did think that that's kind of ingenious to have framed that scene during that montage. That was, at, at the timing they did, that was, that was very, very clever. So they get credit for that for me. I don't think I've got anything else on this. I wish I could tell you who the cellist in the, in the uh, group called the Blacks uh, back in the 90s was, but uh, again, that song's Tortured Holiday. It's on YouTube. You'll love it. KI5, KWG, back to net. Okay, is there anyone else wanting to check in now? No, Quebec, Alpha, go ahead. Uh, I just happened to turn on the radio, and I was fascinated by uh, uh, the person, uh, not uh, KI5, uh, KWG, uh, but the person before that uh, talking about uh, uh, 3D videos and music and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what moved me to Texas, I was moved here a long time ago before many of you were born. Uh, by a company to do 3D graphics in 1983, and uh, uh, I forget what else I was going to say, but anyway, uh, I've heard two speakers so far, both fascinating. Would somebody please tell me what the movie was? Uh, N5SQA. Oh, my apologies. You know, we I should probably have mentioned that along the way for people just popping in. Um, the name of the movie was, um, oh, I just blanked on it, uh, Electric Dreams, 1984. Uh, it's a delightful movie. If you've never seen it, it's uh, free, maybe for a short time. Uh, the Afterglow... Um, uh, Facebook page has information on it. Anyway, have you ever seen the movie? Uh, not to my recollection, but uh, there's a lot of things I don't recollect anymore. Uh, but uh, I'll uh, uh, perhaps uh, scroll around for that and uh, see what I can find. Uh, thank you for getting uh, back to me. N5SQA. Okay, well, thanks for checking in. Um, it's my turn for comments. I actually don't have a whole lot more to say, and it's, we're about to hit the magic hour, and uh, so probably ought to wrap this up pretty soon. I honestly don't have any more observations that I haven't made or that other people haven't made. This is a fantastic net. I really appreciate everybody's participation and insightful comments. Um, but we're going to have another movie next week. KE5 ICX, tell us what's going to happen. Oh, thank you, Brenda. And I even oh, wrote up a ditty uh, for it. It's called the Zero Theorem from 2013. Dr. Shrinkram was an AI therapist, and he'd been assigned a doozy of a human psycho, Clarence Lenz, a computer programmer who actually didn't like Star Trek or Star Wars. It was obvious the guy was a nutcase, and Shrinkram had pulled the bottom of the barrel duty. Something worse was also on the horizon. Fleet had been called back to work after spending most of his life working from home, and the office wasn't a social place he wanted to be. So it's the Zero ther Theorem, September 2nd, 10.30 p.m. Back to you, Brenda, all, and all that's uh, in the usual places, of course. W5FT. All right, thank you. Okay, um, I guess we'll quit there. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and it's 12.01. This is WB5OZL Clear.
Uh, this is KF5ZOE. I, I didn't quite catch the name. Did you say Zero Serum, like Sierra Echo, uh, what's R? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, Zero Serum, KF5ZOE. No, it's the Zero Theorem, as in theory. So, T H E O R E M. And if you want to look it up, uh, oh, by the way, if you want, uh, if you haven't done so, you can send an email to me. Just want to be on the list uh, at my call sign, Kilo Echo 5 India Charlie X Ray at yahoo.com, K E 5 I C X at yahoo.com. I'll put you on the list uh, for the movie and the link. This one's on 2B TV, uh, but it's called the Zero Theorem from 2013. All right, I copy that. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of other things uh, related to what we've been talking about. One is I didn't I didn't remember this earlier, but in the drive-through scene, does anybody else remember drive uh, uh, not drive-through uh, drive-in movie scene? Does anyone else remember going to a drive-in movie and having a flat? parking lot. I remember the parking parking lot seemed to have humps so that all the cars were like uh, positioned where they could point towards the movie screen. I don't remember a flat parking lot, so that kind of struck me as odd. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that when we were talking about 2001, uh, I think that kind of set uh, expectations and a lot of sci-fi movies. We see spacecraft from a third person view as if there's some kind of drone following it around giving some footage. So when earlier this week I was watching the landing of the Chandrayaan um, Indian uh, lunar lander, I was watching that live and when they got to the, they were showing it getting closer and closer to the moon, they kept once in a while going to this view. His battery ran out. A-R-R-L-N-T-S, Net Motley, at 6.30 p.m., W-5-F-C.